and the County Board of Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials have the final say on any issue before us tonight. If you wish to speak on an agenda item tonight, please uh, go to the table to my left and sign up to speak. For those of you who wish to speak, please state your name and your address clearly when you come to the podium. Please speak clearly and into the microphone. Each side, those speaking in favor of an item and those speaking in opposition to an item will have 10 minutes to present for each side. The time will be divided among all persons wishing to speak. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Thank you. Can I have the roll call? Present. 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 Mr. Miller. Present. Present. Mr. 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 Johnson. Present. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our next item, approval of minutes and consistency statements for the January 10, 2017 meeting. May I have a motion for the minutes? Madam Chair, I move that the minutes in the consistency statement be approved from January 10, 2017. Second. It has been moved and properly second that the minutes uh, and consistency statements from the January 10, 2017 minutes be approved. All in yeah. favor of this motion, let it be known by the usual sign of aye. 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 All opposed? The minutes carried. Uh, the next item I have are adjustments to the agenda. Uh, Grace Smith with Planning Department. Staff has no adjustments to the agenda this evening, Madam Chair. However, I would like to affirm that all uh, public notice requirements have been met and carried out through the General Statutes and Unified Development Ordinance and are on file in the Planning Department. Um, I also would like to make an announcement for those in attendance. The Fire Marshal has asked, and he's in the back of the room, um, if you haven't met him yet, that everyone please have a seat. Uh, he will let you know if you need to leave the room if we're over capacity. Um, if someone leaves the room and a seat opens up, feel free to take that seat, but it's very important that we not exceed the capacity for the room. In addition, if um, the Planning Commission and the members in the audience would indulge planning staff, we have a quick um, verbal survey that we would like for you to answer with a show of hands. I'm going to ask a few questions about how you learned about our meeting tonight. We're trying to do some research about our outreach and notification processes. So if you would, raise your hand and keep them raised until the staff um, lets me know that you can put them down. How did you find out about tonight's meeting? Did you receive a letter from the planning department about this meeting? Thank you. Did you see a sign on the property? Okay. Did you see a legal ad in the newspaper? Okay. I think we're good. Okay. Did you hear about it through a neighbor or friend? Okay, great. Um, just hold them up just for a minute if you don't mind. We've got four people counting, so it shouldn't take long. All right, we're good. Thank you very much for your help and your indulgence. Uh, yes, sir. Um, Mr. Bryan. A question. Um, you noted after our packets had come out that Village Heath Z160014 yes. would have to be continued again. Right. Do was, you I need was, some well, action Well, I was going to let you know that at this time, but I wanted to make sure we, everybody was going to have to Staff intends to ask for a continuance for Village Hearth case. Um, the applicant resubmitted that case, and we are, it's under review, and it will be ready for next month. So the staff would ask for a one-cycle, 30-day continuance. Okay. I, I move a 30-day continuance. Okay. Second. 
It has been moved and properly second for a 30-day continuance for Village Heath, uh, item number Z160014. Um, all in favor of this motion, let it be known by raising your right hand. All opposed? Item. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, item number, I do have some adjustments. Um, uh, one of our commissioners has requested uh, Mr. Commissioner Al Turk will be leaving uh, early, so I want to go ahead and get a motion to excuse Mr. Uh, Commissioner Al Turk uh, at some point to leave the meeting. Uh, can I get a motion to So excuse? moved. Second. It has been moved and properly second that Commissioner Al Turk be excused from the meeting early and um, has permission to leave um, you know, at the appropriate time. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by raising your right hand. All opposed, thank you. I do have uh, an additional commissioner, uh, Commissioner Neil Ghosh um, has asked to, uh, because there is a, um, an, an item that he has a three items. Why don't you, why don't you tell me what all three Thank of you. Are. Yes, uh, my firm is representing the applicant on a number of projects on tonight's agenda, so I would ask that I be recused from Churchill Commons, North River Village, and Findle Farms. Churchill Commons, North Hill Village, and Findle Farms. Madam Chair, Mr. I move that the Planning Commission allow Mr. Ghosh to recuse himself from consideration and decision in uh, cases A, 160010, 160002, Z160002, Z160014. Not one four. No, strike that. I'm sorry. Z15000040 and Z160019. Second. Motion by Commissioner Miller and second by Commissioner Whitley that we recuse uh, Commissioner Ghosh from the items as stated. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by the usual sign of, no, excuse me, raise your right hand. Let's be clear. Okay. Thank you. The motion, yeah, the motion passes and you're at the appropriate time. Um, the next item, what, there is a lot of interest here in one particular item. I'm going to ask the commissioners uh, for permission to move item number B under seven, public hearings, zoning map changes, North River uh, Village um, to the to the end of the um, agenda so that we have an opportunity simply because there are other people who have like one or two want to and we can clear them quickly. So, so sure. oh, we're not, okay. And uh, since Mr. Al Turk is leaving early, I wanted to know if he had a, what his druthers might be about that. I, I feel like in the past with big uh, cases we moved them to the front right so people can can leave after but uh, and move the big cases to the front well it's in an appropriate place at this time if we just like to leave the if it is the preference of the Commission to leave the agenda as is um, okay it looks like Madam Chair I move we adopt the agenda as printed with the one correction we had with the contains. Okay. Um, okay, it has been uh, motioned by Commissioner Harris and second by Commissioner Miller that with the one exception of uh, a continuance for Village Hearth that we leave the agenda as indicated. All in favor Question. of the... Um, Question. Um, it, it seemed to me based on um, what well, we were informed that that um, fire code that we need to take some measure to 
alleviate this and moving this uh, moving this item B forward would do a lot to help so that other people can sit down. It's, it's up as far as it can go right now. Yeah, it's Commissioner goes. Yeah, uh, I, I understand what you're saying, Commissioner uh, Melvin, Willie. Uh, but I do think the first case on the agenda actually is not going to take that long, so I think it's fine the way the agenda is right now. I think the problem will be. It's actually first. Right, so yeah. It's actually our first. With Churchill Commons. Churchill Commons, I don't think, is going to take that long. I don't know that there are many people who signed up for that. We do have, I do have well, some, um, I do have some first. individuals who have signed you up. Can't put it ahead. You can't put we'll follow the ahead. agenda as yeah. planned. Because, yeah. Okay, because it has been moved and model. second no, no. that we um, follow the agenda as planned. Did I carry it? Did All in favor of this motion, let it be known by raising your right hand. All right, we'll stick to the agenda. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes. Uh, this. What's the church here? Okay. Item number six: the public hearing, a uh, comprehensive plan, future land use map amendments, concurrent zoning map changes for item uh, Churchill Commons. Yeah. Item number A one six zero 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 one zero and. Um, Z1600022 and Z1600023. Staff report, please. Good evening. Thank you. Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, this case is there are three items involved in this case. There are two zoning requests for the Commission's consideration as well as a plan amendment. Um, case number Z1600022, Z1600023, and A160010. The applicant for this particular request is Rob Griffin. This is within the city of Durham's jurisdiction. Um, this is a request to zone um, property from industrial park to commercial general with a development plan and to commercial general. I um, mean, the, the plan amendment request associated with this is to change the future land use map from industrial to a commercial designation. The acreage is 16, and the proposed use at the subject site, assuming the request were to be approved, would permit 150,000 to 275,000 square feet of floor area for any use in the CG district. The subject site is highlighted in red in front of you. Um, as I noted, there are two different zoning cases involved with this, one with a development plan and one without. The parcel without a development plan is a cemetery, which is located um, along the South Miami Boulevard frontage. There is no development proposed on the cemetery. Um, it's proposed to remain as is. Um, the applicant included this parcel just to maintain conformity in the event that the request is approved. The site, um, as you can see, um, fronts along both Page Road and South Miami Boulevard. It is generally located at the southeast corner of Page Road at South Miami. Um, the, the requested district, as I noted, is Commercial General with a Development Plan and Commercial General. 16-acre um, site, uh, permitting 150,000 to 275,000 square feet of floor area. No development on the CG-only portion, as I noted, which is the cemetery parcel. They are proposing a maximum pervious surface of 85% for the subject site and a maximum building height of 90 feet. The existing conditions, um, as you can see here, this is also noted in the development plan within your packet, um, showing the existing site and its location at the intersection of Page Road at South Miami Boulevard. The proposed development plan um, for the CGD portion, um, this indicates access points um, at the subject site. Some other commitments, again, the intensity is noted. Um, roadway improvements along Page Road and South Miami Boulevard, access points, and a building and parking envelope is provided. Some design commitments, 
Um, there's no, excuse me, no architectural style has been chosen for any buildings at the subject site. The applicant has committed to providing flat or pitched roofs for any buildings. Um, one or more exterior building service materials, and those service materials are noted um, in your case packet, and, as well as no distinctive architectural features for buildings at the subject site. The future land use map, um, as you can see, this site is currently designated as industrial, um, and the applicant is requesting a change to commercial. Um, the change to commercial will permit the CGD and CG districts at the subject site. Um, staff reviewed the plan, um, plan amendment request against uh, the requisite comprehensive plan policies. I'm um, determined that it does meet the policies of the future land use map and comprehensive plan. And in general, staff determines that both zoning requests and the plan amendment is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted policies and ordinances. Thank you. I do have two individuals who have signed up to speak. Uh, Patrick Biker. Good evening, Chairwoman Hyman, Vice Chair Busby, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm an attorney with Morningstar Law Group in Durham. I'm here tonight representing Tri Properties for the Churchill Development on South Miami Boulevard near Research Triangle Park in southeastern Durham. With us tonight are landscape architect Bob Zumwalt, with McAdams, and uh, is Rob here? And Rob Griffin, there. Rob Griffin with Tri Properties, the Associate Director of Development for that fine Durham mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. We're here tonight to you request your timer. recommendation for approval. I'll take a lot less than 10 minutes, I promise. Uh, we're here tonight to request your approval of a plan amendment and the zoning map changes to support new office space and new restaurant space near RTP and Imperial Center. I trust that members of the commission are familiar with the Quintiles building and the outstanding track record Tri Properties has as one of the leading office developers in Durham. Now they need more inventory so Durham can recruit more businesses to our community. But a key ingredient to recruiting new businesses here is new quality restaurants. I can tell you, having worked in this section of Durham from 2006 to 2016, there's a strong demand for quality restaurants. You can see from Tri Properties track record with Mez and Page Road Grill, Grill and the unrelenting demand from customers of those fine establishments that more sit-down restaurants are needed in this section of Durham. So in order to bring in new office space, new restaurant space, we are here to ask for your recommendation of approval for this plan amendment and these zoning map changes. Our team will be happy to answer any questions you may have, and we thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. I do have one additional individual who has um, signed up to speak, Bob um, Zumwalt. You're Zoom Walt, you okay? You've yes. Bob's just here to answer questions. Okay, all right. So there are no additional individuals to speak for. Are they? I have no individuals who have signed up to speak against. Um, if so, I will close the public hearing and give the commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. Commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Miller. Patrick, I'm a little concerned about the cemetery there. Um, I'm, I'm assuming South Miami Boulevard. I'm assuming South Miami Boulevard is um, uh, a state road at that point. Correct. With limited access. Um, and when I look at the development plan, it looks like the building envelope and the parking envelope go right up against the cemetery there. If members of that family want to get in there to that cemetery, to mem members of the Witherspoon family or whoever want to get in there, uh, th there's nothing indicated on the, on the development plan that you're going to leave some sort of way for them to get in there. I would hate to see them blocked by the arrangement of buildings. Sure, Bob Zumwalt with McAdams. Um, we, we did try to make attempt to reach uh, members of the cemetery. We're unable to reach any of them, but yeah, it does have hard. frontage on Miami Boulevard. There is a sidewalk along Miami Boulevard, so there, it, it actually, you know, you could reach So, the, so you could Miami get in that way. Yeah. Well, that's, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Um, it might be difficult to organize a burial that way, but uh, 
It's full. <laughs> oh, it, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you give any consideration? When I went out and looked at the property get because out. of the, the grading and what have you that's going on there, I wasn't able to actually kind of get in and see. Uh, I would kind of look, overlooked it from one end. Mm -hmm. um, did you give any thought to making any kind of, of a buffer around the cemetery? The, um, right now we're not proposing a buffer around it. We would match the grade. The idea is to match grade with the development of the cemetery so that it's not either perched up on a hill or cut down in a hole so that it, it feels like it's blending in. Clean it up a little bit, just make sure it's taken care of. Yeah. I just, I may, I may be entirely alone here, but uh, I think cemeteries deserve a certain amount of respect uh, from all of us and and I realize that that you know the, the land around it has changed and the, and the development pattern has changed but I would love to see there being some sort of vegetative separation between the cemetery the edge of the cemetery and parking lot sure. uh, and I've asked the same thing of other developers this isn't the first time I've brought this up would you consider making a proffer there of giving like 10 feet, 10 feet and some plantings around Yeah, I that? mean, right now there's a 10 foot yard around it and mm -hmm. there'd be required landscaping in that yard. Um, but we don't have any problem doing that. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. That's sure. all I have, Madam Chairman. Jake, if we can flip the planning department, um, just like for Mr. Um, Zumwalt to clarify if that was a voluntary proffer. And if so, could you please restate that for the record? Uh, yeah, we would be we would be happy to plant the perimeter of the existing cemetery with a t uh, ten foot type A buffer. Thank so, you very much. Okay, sure. Thank you, um, Commissioner Al Turk and Commissioner um, Harris. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, so this. Um, this property is in the compact neighborhood tier, correct? And um, it seems to me, I mean, I'm looking at the comprehensive plan and um, I mean, it says auto oriented and low intensity uses shall be discouraged in this tier and that we should encourage alternatives to automobile use. And so I'm, I'm curious why go with the commercial general rather than, I mean, I, I also see here in policy 2.24B that uh, we should utilize a design district. Um, so I'm curious, maybe from staff or the applicant, why, at least for staff, uh, why did this uh, application pass muster in that sense? Thanks. Sure. Jacob Wiggins with the planning department. Um, so staff generally expects this particular compact neighborhood here to away. Um, and I'm going to defer to the acting planning director. I think she can provide some additional information in that regard. Good evening, Sarah Young. This is, while it is a compact neighborhood, it is not on the proposed Durham Orange light rail line alignment. Um, and so at this point, we are, not we are not pursuing a design district implementation in this area. Can I follow up with, uh, I, I, um, I'm not sure what, if there are requirements by the UDO to um, install sidewalks um, here in this case. Jacob Wiggins with the planning department. Um, yeah, typically this type of development, if there's an existing sidewalk, would trigger a sidewalk requirement. So they don't, it, it doesn't need to be a proffer, an ex, or no, a tech? No, sir, that could be something that would be handled at time of site plan. Well, just one thing I could add, if it's helpful. Um, uh, the Imperial Center's got a series of uh, greenway trails that run all through it. So there are a lot of people with Please speak into the microphone there are a lot being of, televised. Sure, there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of office space within walking distance of this site. And so um, being in the compact neighborhood tier, we are committing to the, the maximum street yard, so pulling the buildings up to Page Road and Miami. Um, and there will be, the parking will be reduced so that we're not over parking anything. And it's nice that there are so many offices within walking distance. So I think you're gonna get a lot of that by nature of that. Uh -huh. Thank you. Commissioner Harris. Madam Chair, I'm ready to move the item if there are no more questions. Uh, hearing no additional questions, we're ready for a motion. Madam Chair, I move the approval of Plan Amendment A160010. 
A second. second. We have a motion by Commissioner Harris and a second by Commissioner Busby that we move the uh, plan amendment on Churchill Commons forward. Um, all in favor of this motion, let it be known by raising your right hand. All opposed? Thank you. Madam Chair, I move zoning change 1600022. Up ahead with a favorable recommendation. Second. Uh, the motion by Commissioner Harris to move zoning recommendation. Um, which one was it? Z1600022. Z1600022. Second by Commissioner Busby. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by raising your right hand. All opposed? And Madam Chairman, likewise, Z1600023. Motion by Commissioner Harris. Second. Second by Commissioner Busby um, that we uh, move item Z1600, and that was 2-2 two, two, forward. Two, three, two, three, two, I'm sorry, 2-3 forward. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by Raising your right hand. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Harris. Um, let's move on to the next item, public hearing uh, zoning map changes for uh, Village um, Perth. Uh, staff report, please. And this has already been continued. Jacob Williams of the Planning Department. As a matter of clarification, that case was continued. I believe we're on case Z16-00019. Oh, we have already continued. Yes, thank okay. you. Um, we're ready then for North River Village, a Z150040. Thank you, staff report. Yeah. So we are ready. All right. Jacob Wiggins with the planning department. Please excuse the the typo on the top of this page. This report, I promise, or this presentation, I promise you, is for uh, North River Village. Um, this case um, has been submitted by Halverson Development Corporation. This is within the city's jurisdiction. The request is to change the zoning designation of approximately 29.8 acres to residential suburban 20 to mixed use with a development plan, and the proposal is to provide a range of 67,000 to 90,000 square feet of commercial area and single family dwelling units at a density of 4.0 dwelling units per acre. The context map uh, noting the location of the subject site, um, the case area is highlighted in red in front of you. You can see it is located at the southeastern corner of Guest Road at Ladder Road. Um, the area surrounding the subject site is primarily zoned residential suburban 20. Um, there is some PDR zoning to the west of the site, as well as some commercial zoning to the north of the subject site. The requested district, as I noted, is the mixed use with a development plan district. It's approximately 29.8 acres, a maximum of 90,000 square feet of commercial area. The maximum of pervious coverage is 70% for the subject site. And maximum height um, commitments is for a maximum building height of 60 feet for those in the commercial use area and 35 feet for those in the single family residential area. The existing conditions page is noted in the development plan in your packet. Um, it highlights the outline of the property as well as its location um, at the intersection of Guest Road at Ladder Road. The proposed conditions page. Um, you can see on this page, uh, the applicant has noted site access points, uh, both internal and external, as well as designating commercial use areas and the residential use area. Um, that designation is a requirement of the Unified Development Ordinance for this particular zoning district. 
Um, a summary of the commitments. Um, the applicant, as I noted, has proffered a commitment to provide a range of 67,000 to 90,000 square feet of commercial floor area and single family units at a density of 4.0 dwelling units per acre. Um, this density is both the minimum and maximum allowed in the zoning district. Um, the future land use map designates this area for low density residential, which is a maximum, provides a maximum allowable 4.0 dwelling units per acre for the single family area. The plan also notes the access points for the site, the building and parking envelope for the commercial area. They've committed to a pedestrian path to Easley Elementary School. Um, internal pedestrian pathways connecting the residential and commercial use areas. Open space along the use area boundary line and roadway improvements along Guest Road and Ladder Road. Um, as you are probably aware, um, a couple of these proffered commitments, um, specifically the internal pedestrian pathway and open space, were proffered after the staff report was initially released. Um, so in doing so, um, staff updated the staff report and that has been provided to you all as well as a revised development plan with those proffers. Summary design commitments. Design commitments only apply to the commercial use area for this proposal. Um, there is no particular architectural style which has been chosen. Um, the applicant has committed to providing hip, prep haven, mansard and or flat roofs for those buildings one or more exterior building surface materials and you can find those uh, proposed building materials in the development plan and the summary of the development plan in your packet and the distinctive architectural features which could include one or more of the following glass door front a covered drive through canopy parapet or, and or canopy as i noted the future land use map for the area is um, low density residential the comprehensive plan does permit the use of the MU district within the suburban tier in this area. Some comprehensive plan policies, um, in addition to those noted in the staff report that staff reviewed, um, this plan against for consistency, including the proposed density, suburban tier land uses, contiguous development, infrastructure capacity, as well as other transportation and facility impacts. Um, at this time, um, based upon the, the revisions provided by the applicant, staff determines that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances, and I'm happy to answer any questions you all may have at the present time. Thank you. Thank you. I have a number of people who have signed up to speak, and um, I have 21 people who have signed up to speak against and an additional 12 who have signed up to speak for. So I'd like to have. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Uh, normally we give 10 minutes to the, the folks speaking for and 10 minutes against given the large number of folks that have signed up. I would like to propose a motion to allow 20 minutes per for and against. Okay, motion by Commissioner Busby and I did hear a second, second. by Commissioner uh, Freeman, that we allow uh, 20 minutes uh, for each side. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by raising your right hand. May I have a little discussion, Madam Question. Chair, please? Yes. Uh, I'm concerned. Uh, I mean, a public hearing is for not only for us to hear, but for the people to speak. We have a lot of speakers, uh, and I, 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 I'm grateful for the motion to change the rules for this case because there are so many interested people but for me my feeling is is for anybody's right to be heard to be meaningful they ought to be given at least two minutes um, and so the notion that we would uh, i want the time to be equal that's fine uh, but for the notion that's that somehow uh, somebody could get squeezed and only wind up with a minute or 30 second because of the, peop the people who have gone before them have used more time seems to me uh, unfair and I would prefer us to just go ahead and give everybody that wants to speak uh, two minutes. Um. That would be my substitute motion, Madam Chair. I'll second to substitute. 
Okay, I do have a substitute motion by Commissioner Miller and a second by Commissioner uh, Bryan that we extend two minutes, two minutes to each individual who would like to speak. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by raising your right hand. All opposed? Thank you. And in order to uh, expedite this, I'm going to call a number of names. And if you will line up to go ahead and speak. Okay. Four. Point it. Well, he can't really call on. I'm going to allow you to ask that question, please. <laughs> I thank, thank you, thank you, point of order, and um, I'm going to move back to the rules. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to start by giving uh, those individuals who would like to speak for and starting with uh, Patrick Biker. If I may, Madam Chairman, the amount of time for, for for and against will be equal yes, at the end of the day, absolutely. correct? Absolutely. Okay, we, and, and then just as a uh, formality, we request any remaining time at the end of uh, the, the uh, speakers for the project to uh, reserve the remainder of their time for rebuttal. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Sorry, technical difficulties here. There it goes. All right. Good evening, Chairwoman Hunt. Set? Well, just let me ask the gentleman who uh, was caught up in traffic if you will just come forward and sign your name. I will allow you an opportunity to speak. There's a sheet there. Thank you. There's a sheet there. Right. Sir, on the little table. Right there on the corner. On the left. <clears throat> on, on the left, sir. The other way. There it is. Thank you. Okay, all right. Good evening, Chairwoman Hyman, Vice Chair Busby, members of the Commission. My name is Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm an attorney with Morningstar Law Group in Durham. I'm here tonight representing Halverson Development for North River Village, a proposed 30-acre mixed-use development. With us tonight are Tom Vincent, the president of Halverson, Earl Llewellyn and Sal Massara from Kimley Horn, our traffic engineer and landscape architect, Jarvis Martin with Stewart Martin and McCoy, our property values expert, and Craig and Justin Morrison of Cimarron Homes, the home builder for North River Village. First, I wish to address the concern in the staff report regarding the location of the commercial component for North River Village. What has happened over the past 40 years in Northwest Durham County is the construction of a vast amount of residential development, almost entirely single family detached homes, with nothing close to the amount of retail services that those homes require. This is in stark contrast to Central Durham, near downtown and Duke University, and to South Durham, where commercial development has kept pace with residential development. The result of this lack of quality commercial development in North Durham is many thousands of people who need to drive many hundreds of extra miles every year to meet their basic household needs. About 12 or 13 
About 12 or 13 years ago, Durham's elected leaders recognized the need to undertake a complete overhaul of our land use regulations. Strong community leaders like Becky Heron, Louis Cheek, and Howard Clement, all of whom sadly are no longer with us, and their colleagues voted to adopt a completely new comprehensive plan in 2005. That plan stated in policy 2.3.2E, suburban tier mixed use, quote, through the unified development ordinance, encourage mixed uses by allowing mixed use developments where one of the uses is shown on the future land use map, unquote. While the wording of the comprehensive plan has changed subsequently, we are following that mandate today. I also want to stress there are no inconsistencies between North River Village and the mixed use requirements in section 6.11.7 of the UDO. North Durham needs housing options that are not, that are not completely automobile dependent. North Durham has labored far too long with insufficient quality retail venues. We are here to start changing that tonight. In addition, I believe there is strong evidence that there are two specific challenges facing this section of Durham. First, we have seen traffic congestion on Ladder Road approaching Guest Road, primarily during the morning commuting time. Our traffic engineer, Earl Llewellyn, will address in detail how North River Village will fix that problem. I only wish to add that it is only North River Village that can fix this traffic problem. There are no funds whatsoever in NCDOTs or in the City of Durham's budget to build any traffic improvements at Guests and Latta. Accordingly, if there is anyone here tonight who thinks the current traffic situation is a problem, we submit those persons need to be in support of North River Village. Keep in mind all of the traffic improvements associated with North River Village must be completed by our team prior to the issuance of any COs for this development. Second, our team has seen significant evidence relating to declining property values in this area. Our real estate appraiser, Jarvis Martin, will address that issue. And last, I would be remiss if I did, if I did not mention my assessment that North River Village will create well over 100 permanent living wage full benefit jobs for Durham jobs that typically do not require a college degree. Those are the types of opportunities many of our citizens need. Our next speaker is our home builder, Craig Morrison, and then Jarvis Martin will address property values, and then Earl Llewellyn will address traffic issues, followed by a nearby resident, Mr. Jim Polk, and then we will have the rest of the speakers proceed in order for the sign-up sheet. Thank you. Madam Chair. Madam Chairman, yes. could I request that you ask the audience to refrain from reactions and interruptions? Uh, I would like to hear I would like to hear the presentation and the interruption. I'll lose my train of thought, and we all might learn something. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and I will have to insist on a point of order as we conduct this hearing. And please be respectful of all speakers. Thank you so much. My name's Craig Morrison. I live at 1803 Grand Oaks Road, about a mile from this site. Um, I'm a lifetime Durham resident, and I've, uh, my company, Summeron Homes, has been building communities and homes in Durham and the surrounding areas for over 35 years. We've been working with the developer for well over a year on the conceptual plan. Um, we will, if the project is successful, we will build the, hope to build the homes. We're convinced that new for sale residential housing proximate to services is in demand and we constantly get requests for that. Uh, that, that demand is built up in the last year to two years. Uh, we believe it's an appropriate use for the corner. Um, I passed through that intersection this morning as I do every day, uh, and, and my family does. Uh, we would encourage you to support this project. We think it's a reasonable, appropriate use. Thank you. Mr. Mark, could you please state your address for the record? I just don't have it here. 1803 Grand Oaks Road. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. 
Mr. Martin. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Commissioner. My name is Jarvis Martin. I reside at 3608 Mossdale Avenue here in Durham. I am a longtime residential commercial appraiser, appraiser in Durham with over 30 years of experience, and I'm with the firm of Stuart Martin and McCoy. I would like to take just a moment to thank each one of you for your service. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to sit on that side of the dais a while back. I well understand that that's what makes Durham the place it is, uh, individuals willing to give their time and effort to make our community better. I have been asked by the applicant to look at property values in this uh, area at two prior public meetings within the community. I shared information with those in attendance as it relates to values uh, of existing homes and resale values as they compared with our most recent tax value. And in this case, a lot of the homes in this general area uh, did not keep pace in terms of their resale value as it relates to the tax value uh, as to what some of them actually paid at the time they acquired them prior to the economic turndown. For this presentation, I was asked by the applicant to look at the effect of mixed use commercial development and nearby uh, residential uh, communities. And my, what I did was to look at the uh, demographics in the immediate area where North River is going to be located and then look at other areas that would have some of the similar demographics. Our study that we did in Durham and Wake County, we looked at a total of about 11 sites. I narrowed for this presentation my information down primarily to two sites, uh, one being at the intersection of Highway 98 and uh, Sharon Road, where there's a food line. We looked at the homes that was in walking distance of the site to see what effect that those ha homes have in relationship to homes that were further away. Our research revealed that those homes within what we call walking distance a half mile sold at a higher price per square foot and they sold at a quicker time frame than homes further away. We also looked at uh, homes at, on Fayetteville Street where there's a food line and properties, again, within walking distance of a half mile radius and homes that are further away and had a similar uh, result that those homes that were in close proximity with some walkability were selling at a higher price per square foot and at with quicker marketing times. We looked at, again, other sites. Uh, there were some sites depending upon drivability where there was no impact either way, close proximity or further away but we did not find any location where there was a negative impact of having convenient services such as community shopping and grocery stores within close proximity. So in summary, uh, we are determining that again, these are the things that home buyers are looking for, uh, close amenities to neighborhood shopping, walkability, and the convenient to meet their uh, immediate needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, Mr. Luella, Anderson, and Vincent. Good evening, Earl Llewellyn with Kimley Horn and Associates. We prepared the traffic impact analysis for this project. Uh, sorry, address located at 300 West Morgan Street, Suite 1500 in Durham. Um, as I said, this traffic study was prepared, submitted to NCDOT Congestion Management Unit as well as the District Office and City Transportation Department, all of which have approved the study. We, in conclusion, can note based on the staff report that all, with, with all the committed improvements, all the study area intersections will operate at or better than the City's adopted level of service D and the street segments will operate well below capacity. But what we want to do uh, relatively quickly this evening is, is to show you a traffic simulation that is an additional stage of analysis built upon the traffic study that visually compares traffic operations before and after the project is built out. 
What we have here, if I can uh, pan this appropriately on the screen, that better. This is a simulation of the morning, the, the AM rush hour, if you will. Uh, traffic conditions in this area at about 725 tend to back up greatly along Ladder Road westbound to make a left turn on Guest Road headed into town. So we're going to take a look at this and you can see at the far end of the screen here, this is roughly where traffic queues start to develop at about 730, 745 range. And this is about probably, I would say, somewhere in the order of 12 to 1400 feet. Yeah, what we're looking at here, this is actual signal timing, actual traffic volumes collected as part of the traffic study. And so you, you see that traffic volumes are not getting through on one cycle. In fact, what we've done over here at the far end is tag a vehicle, and it's just getting past Green Oak Drive um, and moving through one cycle, still waiting in advance of Autumn Drive. And, and I will point out that uh, I experienced in looking at the field that people are sometimes allowing gaps to get out of these residential streets and sometimes uh, not doing so. So we, we just passed through the second cycle and it looks like that vehicle has stopped here for the second time, not able to make it. The, as I said, this, this queuing situation begins, it, it's quite long. In the, in the time before 725, but it gets very long, extending the 12 to 1400 feet at about 725. Okay, you see that vehicle finally able to make the turn through the third light cycle. So that's, uh, that's the existing conditions. Now let's take a look at what the con future condition will be. Bear with me one moment. And this is, this is basically looking at the same time of day at about 7.30, morning peak hour, with the improvements that are proposed as part of the site, which specifically uh, includes left turn lanes along the entire length of Latta Road, but a second left turn lane here on Latta turning on to Guess. Now, it looks like there's a lot less traffic on the network here, but it's actually more. It's existing traffic, it's traffic generated by the site, and it's also background growth uh, compounded annually through the build out of the project. And what you're seeing here, and we'll continue to see, is that with, with adding a second left turn lane, you would expect to cut that queue from 1,400 feet to 700 feet. Well, actually it's even better because all those queues using two lanes are able to exit Ladder Road in one cycle. You don't have the compounding queues every morning. What that does is not block the existing residential streets of Autumn Drive and Green Oak Drive. Much more efficient situation, fewer backups, your likelihood of rearing collisions that occur in that style of congestion. You'll also notice that these queues stay within the available storage that we're, pro we're projecting here, which is about 200 to 225 feet. So visually, th that's the, the benefit, one of the huge benefits is of this project as Patrick said there's no funds program from city or NCDOT through their transportation improvement program, which is a 10 year long window of funding. Uh, again, I would add with these improvements, which I believe in total, including all the site access, uh, turn lanes, signal modifications, are on the order of about $2 million. Uh, with those improvements, again, um, the intersections in the study area operate at or better than the city's adopted level service of level service D. All segments will operate below capacity as confirmed in the city staff report. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next speaker is um, Tom Vincent. Craig, well, we've had. We'll have a Jim Polk be our next speaker, Madam Chair. Jim. Give me one second. Did you sign in? Oh, I, I thought I was signed in. I didn't do it personally. Okay. Um, I will need you to sign in. Oh, I have no problem with signing in. I, go ahead and speak and then I can we'll. Do it, I can do it afterwards. Okay. Yes, Thank please. you. Thank you. I have no intention the other than to be recognized, uh, so that was an oversight on my part, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you. Not a problem. Madam Chair, members of the Commission, let me say good evening to you, and on this evening, I come here with excitement and elation, and also I bring the following information as consideration to this North River Village development. My name is Jim Polk, and I live at 512 Latter Road. Durham, North Carolina, 27712. My resident, I've been living there for 39 years, and my resident is less than 500 feet from the northeast edge of the property that's under consideration for development. My family and I have lived there all of this time in North Durham, and it is a welcome for us to have an opportunity to say we support some economic development as well as some enhancement to the quality of life for those of us who have resided in North Durham for that many years. The traffic study that you just saw, I've had an opportunity to observe, participate in the traffic on Ladder Road for all of those years. And frequently, occasionally in the mornings and sometime in the afternoon, the traffic would be backed up from Guest Road all the way to my driveway, which is a little less than a mile. But with the proposed traffic improvement that the developer is willing to do and to add those two turning lanes, as you notice, it will have an in enhancement to the traffic movement in North Durham, unlike anything that we could propose otherwise. So I ask us to really give consideration to that. In addition to it, the project is proposed to bring residential quality living, also employment for people in North Durham, and that economic piece for me is also a salient point. Given that the economics uh, development of that property would also enhance the life of folk who would be in proximity of that uh, property. Good retail ser services and employment opportunities is a welcome sight in North Durham. I would urge us to think in terms of progress for not ourselves just today, but all of the folk who are to come, given that Durham is one of the rapidest growing cities in the southeast of the United States. We need to plan to smartly how to address the things that would come and be developed. So I would urge all of us in here today, all of us that we have some opportunity to participate in the quality of life in Durham, to embrace this notion with an opportunity to believe and know that we can improve what it is that we have. I would like for all of the folk who already know some of the things that I would like to say, given the time restraint, to stand up that's in support of the North Village development property. Stand up, please. Madam Chair and all of you, I say thank you, and the future of Durham is better because of you. Thank you, and I thank you all for all that you do for the quality of life in Durham and the service that you render to our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Polk, and could you head this way and sign this sheet for me? Thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Vincent, let's see. Okay. Sorry, Heather Shepherd, Brett Smith, if you'll follow. Hi, my name is Heather Shepherd. I live at 1204 Torridge Road, Durham, 27712. 
Um, my husband and I moved to Durham back in 2001 and moved up into the North Durham area back in 2003. And there really has not been a good shopping area in our area for that entire time that we have lived up there. I know there are grocery stores in our area, but they, they really lack in comparison to those that are in surrounding areas, uh, such in Southern Durham. Um, the Harris Teeter is much better down on 9th Street than it is even off the one um, off of Horton. Um, and there's really not a lot of other mixed-use property and other retail uh, shops up in that area. So we both support um, anything that North Durham is willing to do um, to grow and keep up with the rest of Durham. Um, we like the changes that have happened in Durham over the years, um, and we'd like to see them extend up into our area of the neighborhood. Thank you. Um, Tom Vincent. Oh, I'm Brit sorry. Smith. Brett Smith, is that you? Correct. Yeah. Come on up. Um, as a member or somebody who lives in uh, Eno Forest, I would like to say that we are uh, very supportive of this uh, use of uh, commercial property coming in. I think it would add a lot, uh, you know, being new restaurants, you know, whatever, whatever decides to go there, whether it's a Publix or whatever. I think it uh, would bring a lot uh, of value, especially considering um, you know the uh, homes that would be brought in. Especially considering uh, you're talking about at least 100 uh, full-time jobs that could be brought to this area um, for somebody that lives around here that works in real estate. I think it's a great thing. So I would just like to uh, show my support. Thank you, Tom Vincent and Benjamin Anderson. Good evening. Uh, Madam Chair, I have to apologize. I forgot to add my wife, Caroline, to the list. Uh, if I can yield half my time to her when I finish. Um, as I just long as she signs the list. As she signs the list. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm speaking Please on behalf- Please give your name and address. Sorry. My name is Ben Anderson. I live at 4330 Lazy River Drive. Uh, so I'm speaking in support of this development. Uh, I'm usually cautious when it comes to uh, new development in places um, such as North Durham, um, but I'm very enthusiastic about this for several reasons, one being the traffic improvements that are being proposed. Uh, it is very clear that uh, it would be very hard to find the financial capabilities to put such improvements in place through public means. So I see this more as a private-public partnership, um, and the proposed uh, improvements would be an improvement, uh, I think, in the traffic pattern. Secondly, I want to support it in, in terms of the jobs that it would provide. Uh, Publix is a company from the state that I grew up in. I'm very familiar with it. I have lots of uh, friends, families that have gone through that company. And uh, it's a very um, important entry-level job, giving people access to uh, not just short-term jobs, but careers uh, with benefits, very good benefits. And so for that reason and the reason to uh, provide other economic stimulus to the area, as well as uh, opportunities for small businesses. Um, uh, people say they don't want it to be like South Durham. Well, I don't think one development, this type of development, would be uh, like South Durham. I think it would be a very responsible type of development that would uh, benefit the area greatly. Thank you. Thank you. Like you said, my name is Caroline Anderson, and I also live at 4330 Lazy River. And I was just wanting to wave in support, mostly because we're really excited. We're transplants from Florida, and we've met a lot of people from the South, and they really like Publix, and it is a great job um, creator, like he said. But personally, this might not seem like a big deal to other people, but I drive 40 minutes to go to the Publix that's uh, in Morrisville, so I know that's taking sales tax dollars out of the county, and so that's just a minor, maybe a minor thing, but I know it's important for me. And again, we drive on um, that road every single day, multiple times a day, so we would love the traffic improvements. So thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, Thomas Vincent. I do. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Tom Vincent. I'm president of Halverson Development Corporation. <clears throat> Excuse my voice tonight. <clears throat> I'm going through a little bit of a uh, down spell. 
I just wanted to make two points. Uh, the first one actually really amplifies, I think, the emphasis that you heard from the crowd here in terms of the need for a quality mixed use development that has quality commercial retail restaurant opportunities for that area. She was trying to improve the picture there and make it a full screen, but... Leave good enough alone. Right. In any event, um, a couple of the points that I want to make. This is a very unique delineated trade area. In the 30 years that we've been developing mixed-use developments, uh, public's anchored centers, there are almost 32,000 people that live within this delineated trade area, the lion's share of which, almost 78%, are north of this site. So you have all those folks living up there with no shopping opportunities, no mixed use environment whatsoever, no quality sit down restaurants, no other retailing opportunities. When we delineate a trade area, normally, we would find an area probably a fourth of the size of this trade area. But because of where the site is situated, if you look at that map, the, the site itself is down in the lower central portion of the delineated trade area. So all of those folks living north of the site have to drive past this site, whether they're coming down Roxboro or whether they're coming down Guest Road, to go past Lotta Road to get to any food stores whatsoever. From a pure traffic perspective and environmentally, that's not good. There's no reason that this volume of people, if we were talking about five, 10,000 people in an area that was early in its growth years, that might be a different conversation, but that's not the case. The folks that are already there are driving past this site to get to any sort of shopping options that they have available to them. The other thing I wanted to expand on, uh, Patrick had mentioned about jobs. We actually did a fairly detailed analysis of potential jobs. Uh, we did it in concert with Publix, um, historical uh, specific numbers that they have for stores of this size. But when you take not only the proposed Publix, but all of the retailers, proposed restaurants, the single family homes, we'll talk about those in a minute from a construction perspective, but just the commercial side of the mixed use development. You're talking about probably over 500 permanent full-time, part-time jobs for this development. The construction jobs alone will probably range over a two-year period, that's our estimated build-out for everything. The single family might even take a little bit longer. But using two years as a capture period, almost 200 construction jobs. 
when you factor in not only the workers, the offsite improvements, the equipment operators, the folks that make material deliveries to the site, everybody in that food chain, you're talking about a tremendous economic opportunity from a jobs perspective from this development as well. So those were just two things I wanted to touch on. I know there'll be other things that'll be asked um, that we can hopefully re respond to at, at your leisure. Thank you. Afna, thank you. I must have Good evening. My name is Paul Hoffman. I live at 2014 Vintage Hill Drive in Durham. I've been there 20 years. And I think that Northern Durham needs this project. And the reason being is how many times you go out to dinner with your wife and have to drive so far, how many times do you, and do you see the stores that are out there now that are improving because Publix is coming? I've shopped at Publix in Florida. I used to live in Florida, and they do a fine job. North Durham needs this. We need the economic growth, and we need the uh, improvement of the quality of life. And I know I drive up and down ladder two times a day, once going to work, and one's coming home. And it's these road improvements that they're going to do are going to be tremendous for the community. And I know for a fact that anyone that's pro opposed to what we're doing, that they're planning on doing here, look around. We'll see them at the Publix. We'll see them at the restaurants. Thank you. Uh, Debbie Swartz. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the Commission. My name is Debbie Schwartz. I live at 5324 Fair Oaks Road in North Durham. I've lived there for almost 12 years. I joined this project's opponents in their desire to protect the character of our neighborhood. However, I believe this project will actually enhance the character, and therefore, I strongly support the rezoning. This project will significantly increase the walkability of the area and options available to the residents. Within a two-mile radius, there are almost 7,000 homes, and many thousand more people will benefit from the development. The two miles to Horton Road each way, every day, is over 1,500 miles every year per person who doesn't have to drive to that intersection and beyond to eat, shop, or run errands, reducing traffic, pollution, and energy. The malls on Guest Road are old and unsightly. This is an opportunity to build a high-quality facility attract high-quality businesses, and perhaps encourage existing businesses to renovate and upgrade. New jobs will be created, and city, taxes will, city revenue, tax revenues will increase from the Orange Person and North Durham County residents who come in. Finally, North Durham is being left behind as Durham prospers. Property values have stagnated. Realtors tell me people don't want to look at homes in North Durham because, quote, there's nothing there. We cannot let our fear of change blind us to opportunities for improvement. Let's put something there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ted Maynor. Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Ted Maynor. I live at 4302 Guest Road. <clears throat> Pardon me, I've been there 37 years, a lifetime resident of Durham. Uh, I support this program. Uh, the reason I think the gentleman was late getting here, uh, we need a restaurant. Popeye's <laughs> has opened up, and that's why you had a problem getting here. <laughs> Everybody's trying to get to Popeye's. <laughs> uh, 37 years, a gentleman said 39. Now that's a long time to live anywhere. Uh, I live next to Eno River. Uh, I'm a friend of the Eno River. Uh, I'm a Durham tree keeper. 
I volunteer for Key Durham Beautiful. Uh, I'm actually a senior uh, member of the uh, parents committee, uh, and I just speak for as an individual today. To, um, progress, I think, is what you're talking about. Uh, when I lived on Horton Road as a young elementary school guy, my dog used to sleep in, on Horton Road. He'd go out there and lay down, and he, he lived to be an old dog. But progress came, and you know, the, you know, you kind of got to expect uh, the good with the bad, and I respect the concerns that everybody has against the program. Uh, progress is something that you got to take some, uh, sometimes good with bad. Uh, so I just want to be sure I, I gave you your, my support to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next individual, Tamara Jeans. My name is Tamara Jeans, and I am the granddaughter of Ethel Womack. Um, we own the other side of the corner lot at Guess and Ladder. Could you please speak into the mic? Yeah. Um, so my family owns the other side of Guess and Ladder. Thank you. I am 52 years old, and so I've been, my family has grew up on that corner ever since I was born. So we have seen um, all kinds of things happen there. Um, but we have seen no progress. Um, the, the only thing that really came was Lattimore, and we did not complain when Lattimore came. So I just, um, I am for the uh, progress of uh, Publix, and forgive me, I am nervous up here. But um, I just want everybody to know that um, Northern Durham needs progress. And I've seen what the city council has done with downtown Durham. Y'all have done a fabulous job. So um, I hope that y'all can see fit to do that with Northern Durham. So thank, thank you, you so much. I do have one additional name that is not identified as, well, actually two names that did not identify for or against. So I'm going to call these two names, Lisa Day Janes and Elizabeth Janes. Okay. That's it. They did not indicate. So, it's, it's the same. is it four? I'm, I'm on the okay. Uh, <laughs> That's a good transition between four and again. <laughs> okay. So, That's a good transition. It's just one person. That's the same Thank you. Good evening, um, Madam Chairman and um, members of the Planning Commission. I'm Lisa Dye James and I am a resident of 1822 Grady Drive. I've been um, a homeowner there since 1998. Um, I'm concerned that the traffic impact analysis that you've already had done has not studied the Grady Drive guest road entrance. Um, it is just north of the intersection of Ladder Road. Um, there are approximately 40 homes on Grady Drive, and our subdivision, which is um, known by Heritage uh, Heights, has around 270 homes. We only have three um, ways to ingress and egress out of our subdivision, and one of them is uh, Grady Drive. Um, so we have a lot of folks that come north. If they want to go north on uh, Guest Road, they come up to Grady Drive. Um, there's a concrete median across Guest Road which prohibits um, a resident of our neighborhood from turning left onto Guest Road. Uh, in order to make a turn, um, one has to go down to the intersection with Latta and make a left-hand U-turn in front of westbound traffic coming up Latta. Um, I am a realtor and I have been one for um, almost 17 years and I know that it's difficult to stop progress. Um, but I would uh, respectfully ask that the commission consider um, making uh, improvements to the Grady Drive entrance, ingress and ingress uh, from Guest Road. Um, and I appreciate your time. 
Thank you. Thank you. This was the last individual um, speaking for, and so you'd like to reserve we some have, additional we'd time. We'd like to reserve the, the remainder of our time for rebuttal. We did have one person come in late, if you don't mind. She'll sign up. Okay. Good evening, and thank you for your time this, this, t this evening. My name is Cindy Burns, and I live at 127 Continental Drive. And to be polite to myself, I've been in Durham all my life, except for about seven years, which still puts me at 40 plus. So I've had lots of time to watch the growth in this area. Biggest thing for me, um, I remember when Willowdale was built. I remember when Cross Creek across the street at Food Line was built. They were both built 30 years ago. That was it. That's the last thing we've had in North Durham. It was 30 years ago with Willowdale and Cross Creek, which houses the food line, to which both of them were built in the same year, 1985. So two competing grocery stores right across the street from each other at the same time. Um, so it can be done. My concern is that we are very, I mean, Durham is, y'all have done a great job with protecting Durham. I completely understand why North Durham's protected so much heavily than Southwest Durham. And I'm not saying, and I don't think anyone that's really supporting the project saying that we want to be a Southwest Durham. But for 30 years to go by, and we're at the mercy of those two developments to better, uh, make their appearance better. I mean, 30 years later, we have an Ollie's and multiple dollar stores. We would just like something, a, just a, a little bit more variety. Um, and, and the restaurants, I mean, I know, I, I love my Italian pizzeria, I love the Mexican restaurant, I mean, I, I, several of my North Durham places up there. But I would love to have more of a sit down, go in, sit down, place to have a variety where it's, you know, for an evening without having to go far. Um, you know, and, I, and when I say, I mean, I know in Durham you can get just about anywhere within 20, 30 minutes, but sometimes you want us just to hang out in your neighborhood, in your own area. And we don't really have that. Um, I, I love, like I said, I, I've been out in North Durham all my life. I grew up there. Somehow I ended up buying a house in the same neighborhood. I still have not figured that out because as a kid we all know we want to move, grow up and move away. And here I am living in the same neighborhood. So I love it. I appreciate it. I work with it every day. But I really think and believe that this particular project is not going to hurt us it's gonna help us. And it's gonna bring us to more together, provide jobs. Those high school kids, Northern, they would absolutely love to be closer to a place to go eat at lunch. So just my two, two cents in reference. Oh, and the sidewalks on Guest Road, have you noticed how much more use they've gotten since they've been there? No one ever walked Guest Road, ever. Now we have sidewalks. I have regular people I see and blow the horn out every morning because he's out running every morning. So I think if we just connect the dots a little bit more, because unfortunately those sidewalks go to nowhere. Thank they you so can. much. Thank you. Are you going to defer any? your additional time. We would like to re keep the remainder of our time for rebuttal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, we'll clear the clock and start again with those individuals who are uh, um, against. 42. Let's, I'm gonna call three people at a time if you will come forward. Megan um, Gray, David or Dave Owen, and Robin Jacobs.
Please state your name and address. My name is Megan Gray, and I live at 2 McCarthy Court. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, thank you for allowing me to speak. In 2003, this area was defeated in a rezoning proposal for 15 acres of commercial development at the very same southeast corner of Guess and Latta. Now it's 2017. This proposal is named Mixed Use, and it's actually virtually no different. Quoting from your staff report, the development plan does not readily indicate how the commercial portion of the site will develop. Therefore, the proposal could potentially develop in line with strip commercial pr principles in lieu of node principles, as prescribed by the comprehensive plan. In 2003, the developers proposed the grocery store as part of a strip mall and two to three out parcels on 15 acres. This phased plan has the commercial side of 15 acres that goes first, and then later the remaining 15 acre residential portion. What might happen if that second portion doesn't come to fruition? This is a strip mall on 15 acres and a set of houses on the next 15 acres. There are separate entrances for each. This is no different than existing strip malls in Durham, and it's not really mixed like a, an area like Meadowmont and Chapel Hill. Again, to quote from your staff report, suitability map indicates that this site may not necessarily be suitable for the mixed use district. The submitted development plan provides two separate and distinct use areas featuring two uses which may not be immediately recognized as compatible, large-scale commercial and single-family residential. Staff cannot determine whether the resulting development would meet the intent of the mixed-use district statement. The current plan does not indicate how utilizing a 30% residual proffer will result in a unified development or create compatibility between the non-residential and residential use areas. I liken this to a Tupperware container with a center divider that keeps the two sides doing each of their own thing because that's essentially what it is. This, this plan does not fit with the residential local area which via a Zillow report. Madam Chair? Uh, thank you. Uh, we've set the clock for individual minutes rather than the whole 42 to be used by the group. Okay. Well, two minutes. I, I do know of some people that were yielding time to me. Well, that was they were, uh, well, then they need to do that. I'm sorry, I was called first. I wasn't sure what to do. Okay. Did you sign up, Ms. Lessie? Yes. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Okay. We'll take care of you. Thank you. Go ahead, Go ahead. Continue, Megan. Okay, thank you. This plan does not fit with the residential local area, which, by the way, a Zillow report that came out today shows 27712 uh, growth of um, value in the homes at 8.5% for 2016 alone. So there is no problem with um, home values in this area. The, the developer can show you plenty of traffic simulators, but the data in hand says that the traffic will actually double if this is developed. How does a gridlock situation enhance our community? This plan creates new commercial structures when there are dozens of vacancies within a two mile radius and over 90 acres offered for development within four miles. Uh, we do have some signs um, that will show you that a little bit later. This plan would create more potential for blight and vacancies with four nearby groceries operating under 100% capacity. We do not need more retail. The future, in fact, is delivery services, and companies like Amazon are betting 100,000 new hires in the next year on this future. This plan takes us to the past and not to the future. The developer will tell you that people in the area want this strip mall. Surely not the residents who experience it every day. We don't feel that a mile or two is a significant distance to travel for our groceries. We move to this area, and I mean this area, not four or five miles away, with the UDO and a residential designation. If neighborhoods five miles away would like a strip center or a grocery store, there is plenty of acreage available for that need. We are placed into an unfortunate situation. We purchased homes in good faith based on the UDO 
and now we are forced to defend the UDO that a Florida developer would like to change. Unlike the development team, this is personal for us because this is all that we have. If the UDO is meaningless and could be changed at the whim of a run-of-the-mill strip mall, why do we have the UDO in the first place? The profit of a developer should not be taken priority over the quality of life of the residents of Durham. In order to be fair, yes. I need to, if someone else could defer some time, if you have. Okay. So imagine, if you will, um, the, uh, co the life in the community if this uh, development comes to fruition. While a developer in Florida counts as money, my neighbors and I sit waiting to get out of our driveways trying to get to our school or work. While a developer counts as money, my elderly neighbor falls and breaks a hip, but emergency vehicles are stuck in traffic and cannot reach the injured person. While a developer counts as money, elementary school students watch their friends leave their school and the overall quality of a once excellent school goes into decline. While a developer counts as money, a weekend hike to the Eno shows trash and oil runoff from impervious surface instead of clean water and natural beauty. While a developer counts his money, with the over, oversaturation of grocery stores, food lion workers receive pink slips when they come to work in the morning. While a developer counts his money, the noise in my yard is so loud that I can't have a conversation with my neighbors. While a developer counts his money, the three o'clock in the morning noise of a dumpster pickup wakes a young nurse from Durham Regional. She doesn't get the sleep she needs, and for her next 12-hour nursing shift, she is prone to making mistakes in patient care. We do not need more retail space. We do not want more retail space. Let's stick with the UDO plan that is currently in place. And may I ask all those who are here opposed to this development to please stand. Thank you. Thank you. Robin Jacobs. They're together. I'm going to call several. Robin, um, Dave is following. Dave Owens follows. Candace uh, Lockamy, uh, Debbie Leonard. She gave up her time. Okay. These two ladies did. So you've got okay. I'm sorry. You've given up your time. And Ra then. Trost. Ra Trost. Ra Trost. I couldn't hear it, so I'm offering, each person has three minutes, and they have two minutes, and they have deferred their time. Two minutes. Each individual speaking has two minutes, unless some other individual who has already signed up defers their time. And with one speaker, three additional people signed up to defer time. So I'm now back to two minutes, with Robin Jacobs. Thank Thanks, I'm gonna to try to talk fast. <laughs> my name is Robin Jacobs and I'm the executive director of the Eno River Association. My address is 4404 Guest Road uh, in Durham. I'm here representing the Eno River Association. The board of the association opposes the rezoning of this property. In the interest of time, my focus tonight is on stormwater and the increased amounts of impervious surface the rezoning would allow over the existing low density residential zoning. More roofs, parking lots, and other impervious surface mean more stormwater leaving the site at higher velocities rather than standing and percolating into the ground. This development is only 2,000 feet from the Eno River. Although regulations require stormwater retention on the site, even under the best of circumstances, such facilities only work as well as they are as as they are monitored and maintained. And as we all know, whether climate change is real or not, freakishly intense storms are be becoming more and more the norm. 
In addition to, storm, to on-site stormwater, the proposed development will create new street services on Lana and Gas, while there will not be any retention or control of stormwater or the petroleum and other pollutants streets collect. Guess Road is all downhill from this development to the river. Lata also slopes downhill to streams that run, run directly into the Eno. During storm events, water is piped off Guess Road into a five-foot hole next to our office, right next to the river. When it's raining hard, the water shoots up several feet into the air out of the hole and gushes into the river about 50 feet away, carrying its trash and pollutants. <laughs> Over the past 50 years, Durham has invested hundreds of thousands of dollars to create, safeguard, and maintain the 404-acre West Point on the Eno City Park, located along two miles of the Eno from Guest Road to Roxborough Road. Thousands of Durham residents swim, fish, hike, picnic, and enjoy a real sense of nature in the park every year. Doing whatever we can to protect this investment and minimize degradation of this special resource just makes sense. The city stormwater services division, will somebody give me about three seconds? No, no, just finish. <laughs> just go ahead and finish. Thank you. The city stormwater services division is working right now with the consultant on an assessment of the Ena River watershed. The assessment is like a health checkup for the watershed and its streams, including, according to their maps, the stream that flows from the pond on the proposed development directly into the river. The assessment will evaluate existing stream conditions and water quality throughout the watershed and identify potential projects to improve the health of the Eno River. Again, approving this rezoning now seems like a step in the wrong direction. Thank you. Please wrap it up. The Eno River Association urges you to recommend against the rezoning. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Dave Owen. My name is Dave Owen. I live at 509 Wanda Ridge Drive in Lock Haven Hills next to the proposed development. Two native crows perched on the roof of empty retail space. They tried to gauge what might come next for such a forlorn place. When asked his mate, I wonder if this spot could be of use for those who wish to execute that guest road market ruse. You're right, my friend, the former said. The match is excellent. Why should they clear a forest grove and act extravagant? With ample asphalt on the ground, and finish wa finished walls erect, commercial traffic everywhere, no zoning laws to wreck. But what about, the former asked, the road to Roxborough, where strip malls line up ticky-tack, not clearly apropos. The latter took a big, deep breath, then snickered with a grin. Let's hope Guest Road will not parade that same mistake again. Such hustle, traffic, noise, and lights are not the vibes we need to raise our chicks in peace and calm is all that we've agreed. The Eno holds our sense of place, of modest means and faith. To change the zone for commerce sake would be to dissipate. The native crows then blurted out three cause with gratitude for city planners safeguarding respect for neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, Candace Lockamy, point of order, please. Candace uh, Lockamy, Rod Troust, Susan Hertz, and Jane Forbes. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Sherry's down here. She's coming. Oh, she, okay. She's not here yet. Yeah, we got you. Thank you. Candace here? Candace, she's yielding her time. Who's the next person? So, Candace Lockham is yielding her time. Okay. So, it's Ms. Trost. Is this Ms. Trost? Good evening, commissioners. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak tonight. I appreciate it very much. I've also written letters to all of you a couple of times and also to the city commissioners. And some of you have responded to my letters and I really appreciate that very much. Thank you. I would like to go on record saying that I am completely opposed to the project. 
And I would also ask that this property not be rezoned. I, uh, my address is 5101 Green Oak Drive. I've lived there approximately nine years. Um, and that's by choice to live in North Durham. Prior to that, I lived a few years on Lebanon Circle, so very, very close to this project for um, a number of years. I like living in North Durham. I chose to live in North Durham because it's quiet and because there's land and there's nature available. I hear owls a lot in the evening. I have deer that come into my yard, and that's something that's really important to me. Um, I think that this project would negatively impact the area and would have a, a significant impact. It would bring noise pollution, it would bring light pollution, it would bring, bring traffic pollution. It would bring more people to the area when it's really zoned residential. And that's the way I would like to see it stay. Um, I think that the Eno River, you, you heard from a number of people this evening how important the Eno River is. This particular property serves as a buffer for the river, it also serves as a buffer for wildlife, for to be able to come and go in the area. And as, as things begin to encroach more, more and more you see more and more dead deer on the side of the road. Um, you know, that's something, this piece of property really serves a purpose for wildlife as well. And I, I'm not really interested in any more shopping or retail. I chose to live in North Durham for the beauty that it has to offer and the quietness and the single uh, housing, single home uh, option. So please do not rezone this. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Hertz. To, 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 to Jane Forbes. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Jane Kirby Forbes. I live at 1419 Imperial Drive in Dorm, North Carolina, 27712. I live in the Brogdon Heights area, which is across Ladder Road from this proposed development. And I have several concerns. My first concern is traffic. Uh, neighbors, there are three neighborhoods that adjoin each other going up um, Guess Road, well, North Guess Road. And frequently people cut through all the neighborhoods to get out to Ladder Road or get out to Guess Road. Um, at Autumn, there is no allowance. Uh, it's very difficult now to make a left turn. It, it's going to be increasingly difficult to make a left turn out of our neighborhood and the two adjacent neighborhoods that use that um, road frequently to get out of the neighborhood, to make a left, to go to the Food Lion, which is right down the road. Um, there is a need for development in North Durham. I would encourage you to use the currently zoned commercial areas for the purpose of commercial ventures. Leave our residential areas the way we have chosen to have them and the reason we live in North Dorm. My other concern, and I will say, I do not mind increased uh, residential per acre but I have some concerns because of overloading of the schools and, and the roads. Um, changing the zoning to commercial near an elementary school has me concerned because the increased traffic, both in the uh, residential area near the elementary school and transient traffic that is near the elementary school and the increased student population. And lastly, the the threat to the Eno, which you have heard most eloquently by other people. Thank you. Please protect the Eno River. Thank you. Um, Aaron, Ploy. Aaron Ployd. Is she coming? And then this last one. Sherry. And Sherry DeVries, if you will move forward. Candace Lockamy yielded her time. Yeah, wait, wait. Uh, Who is this? Sherry DeVries. You have six minutes. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, Vice Chair, Commissioners, thank you for this opportunity. I'm Sherry DeVries. I've lived in Northern Durham for 16 years and in the process of moving into Seven Whittier Way in Lattimore. 
This sits at the site at the crossroads of Guest Road and Lattimore and Ladder Road in North Durham. I request that you vote not to recommend the rezoning of the parcel at Guess and Latta, which would change zoning for this 30 acres from R20 residential to uh, dense mixed use. I'm speaking as a citizen directly impacted with this home across the street from this proposed development. And my reasons for opposing the rezoning request are as follows. The proposed rezoning is for land that is currently wooded with several residential homes. The developer's request for rezoning in order to build mixed use, including a grocery store and other retail within a strip mall configuration and dense residential, does not meet the definition or the spirit of plans set forth in the Durham UDO. This parcel at Guess and Latta Road was to remain residential, and that heavily influenced the Lattimore residents' decisions to buy homes in Lattimore. This proposed rezoning is not in keeping with the goals of Durham's comprehensive plan. This proposed rezoning does not produce more attractive new development that is appropriate to its context, does not improve the urban fabric and function of new development and redevelopment, does not enhance the visual appearance of the community, and does not protect rural character. Citizens are concerned that Durham's rural areas are threatened by encroaching urban and suburban development. Durham should protect aspects of its valuable rural character in an increasingly urban county, and that is directly quoted from the comprehensive plan. This proposed development and rezoning request will negatively impact all of the adjacent intact residential neighborhoods and the elementary school site that surround this 30-acre parcel. Rezoning and developer plans will mean clear-cutting this land, permanently damaging and eliminating crucial wildlife forest habitat that is currently contiguous all the way to the Eno River, just 0.6 miles downhill from the site. Wildlife travel through this area to the river and are sustained by the habitat and wooded areas. The amount of impervious surface that will be installed at this site will also create a very large amount of stormwater runoff. We do not need an additional grocery store. We already have four grocery stores within 1.5 miles, two Food Lions, one Harris Teeter, and one Kroger. The traffic is already horrible here, and the developer has not fully estimated the traffic increase for this proposal. There are many alternative development sites in northern Durham that would be appropriate for redevelopment and revitalization on parcels that are already appropriately zoned for this type of business activity. Please do not offer your support to this rezoning request. Thank you. Thank you. Such a long meeting, I had to go to the restroom. Uh, sorry about Thank that. You. Um, my name is Aaron Plord. I live at 5014 Green Oak Drive. Um, I want to thank you for your service to our community. You have a really big job, and what you decide here today, not just with this rezoning, but with all development in Durham, has a profound impact on our community far into the future. On that note, I know that you've heard for, on both sides of this proposal, some very passionate, um, but what I think is really at the heart of this matter is about the comprehensive plan and about the public good. I don't see that there is sufficient evidence for this development that should sway you to vote in favor of rezoning um, the lot that is uh, up for proposal. Um, it doesn't seem to me that there is much objective measure around this proposal and the impact that it would have on this area. I believe that this rezoning is a litmus test for the comprehensive plan. Whether it's a living, breathing plan that we're going to, um, will serve our community far into the future, not just a year or 10 years from now, but generations from now. But if it is that highly funded developers and law firms who have deep pockets and a lot of resources can simply and get the stamp of approval because they follow all the rules and check all the boxes, 
I don't see what the point of a comprehensive plan is. I don't see where the vision in that is. I hope that you take a stand and do the right thing, especially for those families like mine that will be right next to this development. I didn't move here because I wanted a Publix or anything else. I moved there for the land. I hope that you do the right thing for the future generations of Durham and not just for developers. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do not have any other individuals who have signed up to speak. Yes, that is correct, and I added you to the list. Let me, Mr. Raymond. Um, there's another sheet. Okay, let me take just a moment to find the additional sheet. Oh, this. Wow. They just keep coming. Madam Chair, just to, for the record to be clear, this is, this is the original sheet that we did count right. when we made sure there were equal time, so we're not adding new speakers. These were folks who had signed up earlier. Right, thank you. So Mr. Longo, yeah, there he is. I'm going to call all of the other names that I have on the sheet to make sure. Um, Stephen Wood, Ken Ray, Tom Berman. Right. And if you'll all just come forward. Tom Berman, William Richards, and Josie Owen. We're ready for you, Mr. Raymond Longo. My name is Raymond Longo. I live at 2107 Bayleaf Drive in Durham. I've been resident here since 1980. I'm against their new proposal. Ms. Gray and a couple of other people already covered most of what I want to talk about. But what I will mention is the traffic simulation does not take into consideration, at least in the simulation, the ingress and egress from the new development. Uh, people come, want to go to Ladder are going to have to cut across, uh, coming out of development want to have to go to Lattimore, are going to have to cut across two lines of traffic. If they come out the uh, west side and northbound going on the Ladder Road, they're going to have to cut across traffic to turn left. That being the case, what you need to look at is the uh, intersection of Horton and Guess that has two, north, two left turn uh, lanes going northbound, two left turn lanes going southbound off of Horton Road. One left turn lane going westbound, one left turn, one, I'm sorry, yeah, one left turn lane going eastbound. In addition, it has all the right turn lanes available. The number of accidents that occur on that intersection since they've increased that is amazing. Uh, I'm, I don't have the statistics, but I'm sure they average at least once a week. That similar thing is going to happen right at, the, at Horton and at Guess with the increased traffic. There are going to be increased accidents. There is no way to avoid it. With that, I don't know if, you're in, if your uh, automobile insurance is going to go up because they'll declare that a, a dangerous intersection. I have no idea, but I'm sure it would. That's all I'd like to mention. Any time I got left, I'd like to re, uh, yield to Ms. Gray. Thank you. Let me, let me make just one adjustment because there's one name that was high on the list that I overlooked. And I apologize for that. And that's Mr. David Parker. If you will get in the, you know, in, in the queue to speak. There were just so many names on this list and so much interest. So thank you. Okay. Yes, we're ready. Hi, Madam Chair and all members, uh, my name is uh, Stephen Wood. I live at 4602 Guest Road. I am the only property on Guest Road this developer did not want to buy so I am directly next to it and I am strongly opposing this and there's a lot of issues that have not come up and uh, everybody's complaining about ladder road ladder road ladder road what about guest road and the dangers about out there I have lived at this address for 18 years um, I have seen guest road without lights I have seen the horrendous accidents that have happened now with the lights and now it's a four-lane highway instead of a two-lane highway, it is worse. 
So when you come out of this new development, you'll only be able to turn right onto Guest Road and try to do a U-turn at Ladder. That is extremely dangerous. There's only three or four cars that will be allowed to try to make that U-turn there. Everybody else will be blocking the traffic trying to go north. Uh, there's something else that nobody's talked about yet, and that is the noise and uh, light pollution, which will directly affect my family and the life of, uh, of because my master bedroom actually faces this project. Um, significantly, light pollution robs us of rights of privacy and fair legal use of our land when glaring unshielded lights shine artificial illumination into our property at night. It is an unwelcome violation of our space and light, light pollution can also disturb our sleep. Something else no one else has talked about is the nuisance is the garbage. Um, as meat decays, it attracts bacteria that feast on ammonia acids in the meat proteins. Vegetables can also rot and slowly liquefy. Bacteria attack the vegetable cells, uh, and the fermenting liquids warm up the garbage bags. As more gases and liquids are produced, the bags may rupture. In addition, the rats and flies will be attracted to rotting garbage to pose a health threat. These paths spread disease that can be serious to humans if they get into our food supply. With not only easy ele easily elementary school in the vicinity, I have my own children and my family health and safety at risk. In addition, the rats and flies will not stay at the garbage. They will venture out and land up on, on my property as well as the schools and everybody else's. Um, although there is no single magic bullet, no one size fits all odor management solution exists so the smell will blow onto my property, which will bring the value of my personal life, my personal health, as well as the property value down. And I have had my property valued by four different people, and my property has gone down since they said this property was going into existence. On top of this, um, within two miles, two and a half miles of this project, there is land on Roxborough Road already zoned for this kind of project. Uh, Havison says, uh, or Patrick Baker, uh, be, uh, Biker said, and I sent you all the newspaper article, um, that there's 40,000 unopposed people. Fine, like I said, two miles away, there's already land zoned for this. If he's so worried about these people, go out to Orange uh, Factory Road with this land out there already for sale on Roxborough Road, which will cover Treyburn, uh, uh, Bahama, everybody else out there. So Thank I'm, you. Ju I'm just asking you all to please oppose this. Thank you so much. Please come forward as I've called your name and state your name and address. Come on. Hello, my name is Ken Ray. I live at 1416 Miramont Drive. Uh, that's right at the end of autumn. That is my son, Zach Ray, who is bringing you some maps. If you would take one and pass it down, I would appreciate that. Um, oh my God. While you were passing the map down, I would like to say that I'm sure the people who run Ty Spoon, Matt Atlan, uh, Dragon Inn, would be pretty disappointed to hear your opinion that their establishers, establishments are not quality dining establishments. That's just too bad. One of the things that Halverson's over-optimistic traffic cartoon has failed to show you is how each weekday, morning, noon, and five, dozens of people escape the traffic going towards, lot, going towards guests by turning on our street, Autumn Drive. They turn down Autumn Drive, they blast down to Redmond, they make a left on Redmond, and they're back out on guests again. Our neighborhood isn't meant to handle what's happening now. You can only imagine how many more dozens of people would use our street as an exit valve every single day if this development were to go in. And I bring that up to bring this up. If you'll flip your map over, with today's global positioning satellites, you can be pretty darn sure that people who are headed towards the city on Guest Road and wanted to go into the new development would say, hey, I can bypass this stoplight right here by zipping on down to Lebanon Circle, going up Lebanon Circle, and getting right back on Guess Road to go into the development. That would leave them driving right in front of Easley Elementary School on a road that's barely 15 feet wide. This area was not appropriate for a strip mall when it was made. This area is not acceptable for a strip mall now. And as long as people live on Autumn Drive and Green Oak, and as long as children go to school at Easley Elementary School, this neighborhood will never be an appropriate or acceptable location for a strip mall. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mr. Ray. Tom Berman. Josie McNeil Owen from 509 Wanda Ridge Drive. I meant to give my time to Megan Gray. I, I'm not talking well, so may I give my time to whoever's left here? Yeah, she's right. Thank you. She's yes. And you are signed up, so okay. Thank you very much, and so thank you for your proceed. patience in hearing us out tonight. And you have done a great job with downtown, and whoever put together the comprehensive plan knew what they were doing. They made this parcel low density for a reason. Now, I don't know the reasons. Was it the elementary school? Was it the Eno? Was it to give us a visual break from the endless strip malls that come off of 85, whether you're on Guess or Roxborough or Duke? I mean, this is, this is an opportunity to redefine Northern Durham by keeping the zoning that is already here. And I think that if you go look at the Publix in Cary, which I did, I'm not from Florida, so I don't know anything about them. I went over there and went around the store. I don't see it being much different than Harris Teeter. It's not a place that my teenage kids would have hung out. And when you look at the restaurants, well, there's a Wendy's across the street, there's a Burger 21, and there's a pizza place. Now, I tell you what, I think Gochilina is probably better than any of those. So I don't know that we need this, but I guess the thing that is really bothering me is that we're focused on all the people that live north of Latta Road. And doggone it, the people between Latta and 85 are getting hammered. Look at your community crime map. Holy cow. In that area of strip malls from Roxborough and Duke all the way over to Guess, down around Horton Road, where all these other grocery stores are, is nothing but crime every day. There was a murder at the BP on Guess Road today. Two days ago, they were pulling some people that had a, a, assault with a gun out of the CVS over there at, Rox, at uh, Latta in Roxborough. So what are we getting to have a, a better grocery store? And here's what I feel like we're going to get. We're going to screw those people that live south of Latta Road again, because what will happen is, Publix will put one of those other grocery stores out of business and we'll have another commercial eyesore down there where we Thank already have a bunch of them. Thank you. Let's wrap it up. Um, our next individual. My name is Tom Berman. I Thank live you. at 503 Parkview Drive in Lock Haven Hills. Thanks for the time tonight to speak with you. Um, in our neighborhood, we had a vote to see whether or not we would support this proposal or not. We have about 160 homes and our vote was 82% against this proposal. And our neighborhood is adjacent right uh, next to this proposed um, land. Um, the developer claims that this will increase access for food and grocery stores, but that's not true because we have two other major grocery stores at the same latitude, um, two more within two miles. And then if you go another four miles, you have four more grocery stores. So we're already oversaturated. As you can see from the posters, we're also oversaturated with vacancies in retail space. So Durham, North Durham does not need any more empty retail space. The developer also claims that this is going to bring in jobs, but I think what it will really do is just shift jobs from one store to another. And like the previous gentleman commented, Food Lion or some other grocery store will then become vacant south of this location and we'll have the same problem again and again. This also sets a bad precedent that if this land is rezoned, the land immediately across the street will also be rezoned much easier, I believe. And then this whole intersection will look just like Roxborough Road and will have this never-ending retail um, chain begun at this intersection. This will also kind of continue the sprawl in Durham, which recently was um, noticed as Durham Chapel held the second most sprawling medium-sized metro um, for cities in the U.S. Finally, ironically, sorry I'm running out of time, when you think of Publix, although it might not be a Publix, you think of the word public and you think maybe community-minded or working together, but that really isn't the case because if Publix was thinking about how to help Durham County, they would come in and say, Durham, where do you need a grocery store? Where are places? And you can look on maps that have looked at food availability. Thank you, and please wrap it up. Sure. Okay. There's a food desert where they could put things. There are empty storefronts where they could put things. And instead, they're trying to ram this down us.
They could also use space that could be rehabbed the way Starbucks and Harris Teeter did, also in North Durham. So there are good examples that they could follow. I think they need your leadership to help keep them in line. Thank Thanks. you so much. Uh, William Richards, and then I'm going to call the names of all of the last individuals that I have, Jeff Williams, Keith LePage, Danielle Thomas, and Roxanne uh, Van Faro. If, if all of those individuals will come forward. And William Richards, please. Uh, so my name is William Richards. I live at 5116 Green Oak Drive, one of the roads that would be directly across from an access point on the proposed strip mall, uh, which is what this will be regardless of what they want to call it. I mean, it's a grocery store with a bunch of other smaller stores and a huge parking lot. I mean, it sounds like a strip mall uh, to me. Um, I feel like the only reason why this is getting the time of day is because Publix is interested in placing a store there. Uh, if it was Harris, Teeter, Kroger, or any other business, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. So kudos to the Publix marketing people. Uh, they've certainly done their job. Um, I grew up in South Florida, went to Publix with my mom, dad, every weekend. I'm very familiar with it. And all I can say is that it's a grocery store. You know, they have food and you can buy it. Um, that's all that it is. Um, I've heard arguments um, that, you know, the neighborhood is stagnated that, and that this is progress in the future and everything. But uh, I don't see what's so innovative about another strip mall. Um, we've been doing this for decades and people have been complaining about them for decades. Um, it doesn't fit the character of the neighborhood. Uh, this part of town is quiet. It's part of the reason why we moved to this part of town. Um, I thought it was for people who wanted um, it to be quiet. Uh, another thing is that one of the things that they've been talking about, especially when they initially proposed this project, is the uh, walkability of the project. Um, and there's nothing about the plan that's walkable, starting with the fact that you'd be walking to a grocery store. And I can't think of anything else I'd you know, less like to walk to. Uh, I certainly don't want to be carrying 50 pounds of groceries home. Um, and additionally, the roads in the um, established neighborhoods are anything but walkable as well, and the proposed road um, improvements would make the area even less walkable than it already is. Uh, in order to get from Dover Ridge to the shopping center, you would need to walk down meandering roads and then cross four lanes of ladder road uh, traffic, and then uh, you would need to walk through an enormous parking lot, and I can't imagine that anyone's going to walk to that Publix. Instead, they'll drive, and then what's the point? It'll save you just three whole minutes to the next Harris Teeter, which is literally three minutes away. I time it every time I drive it just because I'm going crazy here thinking about this. Um, so we have four grocery stores within two miles, and Harris Teeter is the furthest one, and it takes three minutes. Thank um, you so much. Thank Please you. wrap it up. Hello, my name's Jeff Williams. I live at 304 Hard Scrabble Drive. Uh, Madam Chairperson, thank you. and. Uh, Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your service. Uh, I'd also like to thank the staff for their thoughtful analysis of this application and uh, state that I am opposed to this rezoning. Uh, the Unified Development Ordinance is a good thing. It and the associated zoning maps give us the ability to purchase land and under clearly understand the limits of its use of both our, our land and the land around it. You know, both now and in the planned future. Uh, I believe this rezoning does not honor the spirit or the intent of the development ordinance. Four minutes, that's how long it takes to get from the subject property to the two shopping centers, two grocery stores, and two chain drug stores at Horton and Guest Roads. I believe that the cost of this small convenience will be the degradation of the peaceful surroundings at Ladder Road. And that's just, this is just the tip of the wedge. As sure as the excitement of the shiny new store wears off as fast as that of a, the smell of a new car, another outside moneyed interest will come with tales of turn lanes and wonderful shopping experiences. And before we know it, the 70 acres at Russell and Guest Road will have a target. Please recommend against this application and spare us from the mind-numbing retail cacophony that is New Hope, Streets, or Briar Creek. Please reject this rezoning and preserve the peace and tranquility that so many of us cherish north of the Eno. Thank you. Thank you. Keith LePage. Thank you. Danielle Thomas. And Roxanne Van Farrell. Okay. I would like to thank you all for allowing us to speak our mind. 
Um, I would just like to talk about Easley. Not many people here today have actually spoke about Easley and how it is going to affect them. Like their website said, the retailer said, we don't want any negative impact, but I believe that it will be a negative impact upon the school. Easley just isn't a school that kids learn about math and reading. It has a hands-on approach to more important topics such as the environment and wildlife. This year, my son was able to have an opportunity on a field trip outside. By not having a lot of homes and traffic in the area, the environment blooms and the wildlife thrives. This trip has happened for many generations. I once was an Easley Elementary School student, and I remember that trip. There aren't a lot of kids today that can say, I see owls, I see bunnies, I see deers and birds and other animals at school. By rezoning this area, that would be selfish of us. Taking away from the kids within, excuse me, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Taking away these kids from learning something so important to us. I ask that the type of learning, which type of learning is more effective, a hands-on approach or a textbook? Today, we teach our kids about global warming, preserving the wildlife in our environment. We teach our kids as a community to recycle, plant trees, protect wildlife, and not to litter. If this area gets rezoned, my son would be devastated. Like he says, we need trees and oxygen. And what about if you all left home today, went home and everything was gone? That's how these animals feel, very sad. Excuse me. Let's all be role models to these kids by showing them that we want to save the environment, not just now, but later, when they become great leaders of Durham, as you all are. Let's not be hypocrites to the children about what we are teaching in the classroom versus what we are doing in the wildlife and the environment. P please keep the current law and say no to rezoning. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And Roxanne Farrell. Van Farrell. Hi, I'm Roxanne Van Faro. I live at 5033 Green Oak Drive, uh, less than a quarter mile away from the proposed de development. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to speak to you tonight about Ladder Road. Um, we've heard a little bit about it, but I wanted to expand on that a little bit. Um, Ladder Road is a critical east-west artery for northern Durham. It's only 1.2 miles long and it is the shortest, most direct route between Guess Road on the west and Roxborough Road on the east. The nearest east-west artery is Horton Road, which is 1.5 miles away because the river lies in between. And to the north, it's f the east-west arteries are further and not straight, so longer. As someone who lives so close to Ladder Road, I want to share my experiences. The first two words that come to mind when I think of Ladder Road are narrow, and windy. There are only two lanes, one in each direction, and there's very poor sight distance as you drive along. There are trees and houses all along, both sides. The posted speed limit is 40 miles per hour, but most cars drive about 50 miles per hour. There are no sidewalks. I have walked along Ladder Road and received many stairs. I've had to walk in the ditch and across driveways. I've imagined biking on such a road. I have done so. Uh, to my own peril. It's very dangerous. Safe drivers will slow down in entirely, almost to a stop when they see you. Dangerous drivers, not so much. Safe drivers might also pull all the way around you into, a, into the other lane at their own peril. In the 1.2 mile stretch of Ladder Road, there are eight intersecting roads into residential areas with no stop signs or no four-way stops and no traffic lights. Um, a road like this requires foresight from planning commissioners. Yes, traffic has been increasing and will incre continue to increase. So the question should be, how can we make this road safer? The last thing we should do is build 60 new residences along this road. And the last thing we should do is believe that an extra turn lane will solve a p potential traffic nightmare. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I do have one additional adjustment to make. I believe the proponent has three minutes remaining. What, one thing, Madam Chair, if I may, 
Uh, when we when we made sure we had equal time, we did add one additional speaker who was speaking against. So I'd like to just make sure we add additional two minutes for Mr. Biker and for the proponents to to make sure we have five minutes, and that way both sides have even amounts of time. So that means, Mr. Biker, you have a five minutes for rebuttal. Patrick Biker again for the applicant. Our landscape architect, Sam Osara with Kimley Horn, would like to address the uh, environmental and stormwater issues. Uh, we believe we thoroughly addressed uh, traffic and the uh, market issues that were uh, raised by the opponents, but we would like to give further testimony in regards to uh, environmental and stormwater issues. So I'd like to introduce Mr. Sal Musara. Uh, good evening. Uh, Sal Musara, I'm with Kimley Horn and Associates, uh, 401 Fayetteville Street in Raleigh. Okay. Um, just in response to some of the concerns, which we, we absolutely appreciate in terms of stormwater and environmental impacts. Um, bottom line, this development, like every development, is, is beholden to both local and where applicable state regulations in terms of how we deal with uh, environmental impacts and the effect of, in particular, stormwater uh, from these projects. Um, the project has not been engineered yet, but when it is engineered, uh, it will meet, uh, at a minimum, meet your local regulations to address stormwater quantity and stormwater quality. Um, both of those have to be addressed um, before that stormwater leaves the site. And bottom line, we have to deal with stormwater generated by new development such that characteristically when it leaves the property, it functions in the same way it does today before the site was developed. So in terms of slowing the water down, releasing it at a slower rate, uh, that is the standard that we have to meet and that we will meet. Um, quickly, comments in regarding consistency uh, with the comp plan. Um, we always appreciate the hard work of your staff. They are your technical uh, kind of advisory uh, in a technical advisory role uh, to this body. Um, and we appreciate the fact that after their study and analysis that they find the development is uh, consistent uh, with the comprehensive plan in their opinion. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Madam. Madam Chairman, uh, just to clear up some issues that were brought up about Guest Road, our traffic engineer will use up just the last couple minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We did focus our uh, uh, simulation and traffic study presentation tonight on Ladder Road for obvious reasons. There are existing backups in that area. But to, to, to address Guest Road, because that is important and was mentioned tonight, we simply wanted to point back to the staff report, which indicates that there is excess capacity on guest road it was widened to a four-lane median divided facility and i think 2005 2006 that time frame um, with our project the volume to capacity ratio will only be 61 percent so just a little above what it's capable half of what it's capable of carrying so just want to clarify that thank you Madam Chairman, our, our team is happy to answer any questions the Commission may have. Thank you for your time tonight. Okay, we're ready to close the public hearing. Unless you have signed up to speak, I cannot recognize there may be an opportunity for some of the commissioners to ask questions, that, um, but I, I'm, I've got to close the public hearing at this time. Uh, recognize Commissioner Bryan. I'm just trying to get on the list. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to ask for, okay. I have a little cheat, so I, okay. I'm closing the public hearing to give the commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, Commissioner Bryan has, uh, was first Commissioner Whitley and uh, Commissioner Al Turk and Commissioner Busby, okay. We'll start with Commissioner Bryan. Wait a minute, wait a second. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to just make a, some statements 
and I want to begin by thanking everybody who contacted me to express their opinions about this. And I want to thank everybody who came out tonight to listen, to speak. Uh, I have noted that there are a number of people who feel that development in North Durham is stagnant, especially when you compare it to South Durham. As a 42-year resident of South Durham, I just want to caution you to be careful of what you wish for. A lot of what made South Durham a really attractive place to live has been lost to development without any real noticeable increase in the quality of life. Now, that's the public service message. Uh, <laughs> I've noticed that there is quite a bit of support for this project, and I think that may be at least partially due to the fact that Publix is involved with it. However, all this support does not change the fact that this is not a true mixed-use project and should not be approved with mixed-use zoning. I think there are several uh, consistency problems with this proposal as it's been submitted. And I also have concerns about location and what will actually be built there if it does get approved. But what I want to talk about is are the consistency problems that I see. Uh, in the staff report, when staff was you know, measuring this project, against the policy 2.2.2F, suburban tier spacing of commercial nodes. Staff concluded that the proposal meets two out of the three standards in that policy, but they let the applicant off the hook on the standard which I think is the most important one, namely, separate distinct nodes of commercial development by a distance of at least one half mile measured from the outermost edge of the node. If we're going to let developers, applicants who come in off the hook on this standard, then I believe we're setting a very bad precedent and potentially opening the door for future commercial sprawl. And in my opinion, we, uh, uh, the policy, the proposal should meet all three standards in this policy in order to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. It doesn't, and I don't think it's consistent with the plan. Uh, there's another policy which the staff does not talk about in their report. Uh, which I believe should be considered, and that's policy 2.2.2D, suburban tier mixed use. In an abbreviated form, what that says is, is through the UDO, establish and utilize a planned zoning district that encourages an appropriate mix of land uses that are physically and functionally integrated. And I believe that this proposal fails the physically integrated test. And I'll say more about that in a minute. Another, uh, another policy which I found, and I found this online, and, and for those of you who may not be aware of it, the comprehensive plan is online at the City of Durham website, and I reviewed the chapter two on the land use element prior to coming to this meeting. But another policy I found there is policy 2.3.2E, also called suburban sub tier mixed use. And uh, Mr. Biker quoted the first part of this policy earlier which is through the UDO encourage mixed use by allowing mixed use developments where one of the uses is shown on the future land use map. The part that he did not quote was projects qualifying as mixed use 
shall incorporate significant vertical integration of residential and non-residential uses in order to achieve, achieve true mixed use rather than the multiple use projects that typically result from hor only horizontal integration. And again, there, there's no vertical integration of uses on this. So when I looked at these policies and compared the proposed project to them, I concluded that it really does not, is not consistent with a comprehensive plan. I also disagree with the staff conclusion that it meets the unified development ordinance. Uh, the applicant did make a number of late pro offers to address some of the intent of UDO subsection 4.4.5. But if you look at what it says in, in that, this is what it says. The MU district is established to provide innovative opportunities for an integration of diverse but compatible uses into a single development that is unified by distinguishable design features. That's the key part that's missing. The only thing we know about the residential part of this is that the houses will not be over 35 feet high. Everything else about design relates to the commercial element and there are no distinguishable design features that unify this project uh, specified anywhere. Now, I also went out and I, I looked at the website that this project set up. And one thing I noticed on that website was an artist's drawing of what this project could look like. Now, if I assume that this drawing reflects the true intentions of the applicant, then what I noticed was a commercial piece and a residential piece with a buffer of trees between them. And that, uh, it, you know, really made me think that this is really a project consisting of two separate distinct uses which the applicant intends to buffer against each other. To me, buffering these two uses from each other is opposite from integration of uses that's required by the policy that I referred to earlier. Since these uses are distinct, uh, if these properties are to be developed, I think they need to be developed independently of each other. I think the commercial part should be developed with commercial zoning, maybe CC or CG. In order to do that, the applicant would first need to go through the plan amendment process to see if he could get a commercial land use designation placed on the commercial piece. And then I think the residential part needs to be developed under residential zoning, maybe RS-20 or RS-10 or maybe even a PDR. But in my opinion, trying to blend these two distinct uses together under the auspices of mixed use simply does not work in this case. Now, as I said earlier, I have other concerns, but I've already talked longer than I should have, so I'll yield the floor for other, to other commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. Commissioner Al Turk. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, I want to echo a lot of what Commissioner, Commissioner Bryan has said. Uh, first, by thanking everyone for coming and reaching out, emailing, and writing letters. Um, I think this is obviously a very contentious case. I've only been on the commission a few months, but this is by far the most contentious. Um, and so, no matter how I vote, I know I'm going to upset a lot of people. So, um, with that in mind, I, you know, I try to base my decisions on two things, public input and the staff reports uh, that Commissioner Bryan uh, uh, mentioned. 
In the first public support, you know, uh, it seems like, based on the emails that we've gotten and the attendance here, this is a very split, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who want this development. Uh, they want new uh, development in North, North Durham, and there are others who do not. Um, and so, uh, you know, based on how split this is, it, it's hard for me to make a determination based on, you know, just public input. But I do want to then say um, that, you know, the second thing I, I look to is the staff report. And I think there are a couple of things in the report that are, that I'm generally in favor of, and, and I will say that I'm, I'm probably more in favor of development than not. Um, but there are a couple of things in the staff report that I think are, are positives. The, the, I think the, the traffic simulation and the traffic assessment that was made is, pretty, is convincing to me that this would help with flow of traffic. And I, I, um, and I think you know, the impact on school might be minimal, at least in terms of the new students. I understand that it, it may have other impacts on the school, um, the elementary school nearby. But I do want, so let me just, just quickly go through some of the concerns that I have. Um, and, and I want to, again, echo Commissioner Bryan um, on some of the, the consistency with the, the comprehensive plan. Um, and, you know, there are, I'll point to a couple of policies that I, that I noticed. Policy 2.22E, this, this is in the suburban tier. Uh, and, you know, the, the policy, the comprehensive plan says to discourage auto-oriented commercial strip development and encourage commercial nodes. I, I want to point out that the staff said that, you know, based on the development plan that is, that the applicant has given us, the staff cannot in, um, determine uh, whether, you know, this would develop in line with strip or commercial node. Um, so that's really one I think that, to me, is one of the biggest concerns, and I, I want to point to another policy in the comprehensive plan, policy 4.23, a commercial development design, and I'm quoting here. Um, again, this, is, this applies to suburban tier. It says, develop design standards to limit ex expansive parking lots in, in front of strip commercial development. Again, I think that the development plan that we've been given does not show that, you know, that this would not be developed in a way where there's expansive parking lots in front of a strip commercial development. Um, and the comprehensive plan, I think, is pretty clear that, you know, we should encourage, again, uh, discourage auto-oriented strip development, encourage commercial nodes. Um, and, and I think, as it stands right now, I don't see how the development plan shows us that. Um, there are a number, there are a couple of other, you know, the, continu the two, policy 2.31A, contiguous development. Um, you know, again, I think that the staff report shows that, you know, not sure that this um, application is in line with that particular policy of taking advantage of existing urban services. Um, and then finally, uh, again, uh, compliance with the UDO. Um, you know, there, in the last paragraph of that section, staff cannot make a determination based on the development plan uh, whether this development would meet the intent of the mixed-use um, district statement. Um, given, I mean, I think given these particular concerns, I, I mean, I, ha I, ha I guess I have a question for staff. Uh, given that there are a number of policies where the, uh, the application is not consistent with the comprehensive plan and the UDO, I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm puzzled by the fact that you determine that this request, in general, is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the UDO. Um, and then I, I guess I would ask the, the applicant whether it is possible, you'd be willing um, to and able to provide more details, I think, in the development plan for us to, to determine whether this is in line with mixed-use uh, development. Thank you. Certainly, Jacob Wiggins with the planning department. Um, one thing that I would like to point out in regards to the comprehensive plan, some of the policies that were pointed out, um, you start off with the phrase, you know, through the unified development ordinance. And when there's that language, that really means it's more like a homework assignment for staff, um, something that staff should work on and incorporate into the ordinance. It's not necessarily policy in of itself. It's something that staff is to do to try to work into the ordinance over time. Um, 
in, in regards to some of the specific policies, um, you know, I believe Commissioner Bryan noted that staff found that two of the three commercial nodes, the staff um, believe that the development did meet two of those. Um, and that is true. I don't believe that staff is necessarily letting anyone off the hook. I believe that staff just pointing out to the commission that based on our analysis, it does appear that the proposal meets two of those three items. Um, the proffers that the applicant provided, um, namely the um, internal pedestrian pathway, as well as the open space, did, in staff's opinion, um, meet the or more closely aligned with the intent of uh, the comprehensive plan, as well as the intent statement for the MU district, as defined in section four. Um, the mixed use district, in of itself, is flexible by design, um, and I believe that the the ordinance gives a fair amount of discretion to the applicant to design a, a district of their choosing. It does give some guiding principles, as, as you all have, have noted. Um, overall, based on the proposals or the proffers that the applicant gave, staff felt that those more aligned with that. However, I believe the, the commission certainly has it within their discretion um, to review those as well. Um, so I believe we have staff felt that it did meet the, the minimum requirements of the UDO. Um, and, and that is what we based our report on. Uh, the chair recognizes Commissioner Whitley. Yes, um, let me speak to the transportation. <laughs> My question is, um, is there any plan by the city to create the same traffic calming um, that this project would bring to that area? Um, Bill Judge with the City of Durham Department of Transportation. Uh, there are currently no um, active or funded roadway projects at the intersection of Guess and Ladder Road by either the City of Durham or NCDOT. There is a, another project at Roxboro, Lata, Infinity to address some issues there, but um, which is relatively near to this site, but, but none at the specific improvements that the applicant's um, proffering to make. I, maybe I should have added, um, are there any long-term plans to? Uh, not um, right can, now. Can, I mean, can, obviously, we're, we're always looking at uh, potential projects and needs. Uh, most of the focus in this area has been directed to the, the Roxborough Lata Infinity intersection that has, um, well, similar and slightly worse problems. So that's, um, that's why we've been in basically working towards developing a project on, on that intersection. But um, there's always a potential that at some point in the future that there could be a project at this intersection. Okay. Now, you've heard the uh, developer, you've seen the developer's um, traffic calming analysis. Um, what's your opinion of that? Um, yes, we did review the traffic impact analysis, um, the city of Durham as, long, as well as NCDOT with the applicant and um, that was the solution that all three parties basically agreed would be the the best use um, for a roadway improvement to address the existing traffic as well as the proposed development traffic. Thank you, Mr. Judd. Um, Mr. Biker. Why is your project um, a mixed-use project? Thank you for asking that, Commissioner Whitley. Um, our team started on this project uh, a good year and a half ago, and um, we were very diligent reviewing both the comprehensive plan, but even more specifically 6.11.7 in the UDO. And we found that very particularly. Um, and so, to our knowledge, this project meets every requirement, whoops, I want to drop that, in 6.11.7, which is, you know, five pages, five or six pages of standards. I, I think the best, what, an analogy for us to look at, and it was a project developed in Durham a, a long time ago now was Woodcroft, where it was developed with a shopping center in the front and residential in the back, and you can see people walking down the paths to buy something at the hardware store or the grocery store or go, go to eat at one of the restaurants. 
So I, I believe it does meet the intent of the mixed use, uh, certainly meets the intent. And it, again, it's something that we put together a, a first class team to put this project together. And you see that on our website. Uh, we, we're not trying to hide the ball here. We've had that website up for over a year so that people could look at it, think about it, give us their input. And we've had a lot of input. Most of it, to be frank, has been positive. And so um, to the extent that uh, there are issues with it, as Commissioner Al Turk raised, th that really needs to be addressed through changing the standards in 6.11.7, because this is, what, this is how we design our projects. We have to follow this ordinance. It's the roadmap, and we follow it, and if people are not happy with it, that's fine. But we need to change the roadmap so that people who are looking at investing in Durham, creating jobs, creating tax base, and uh, investing in uh, traffic improvements, uh, know what the rules are. And so we believe we followed the rules. Uh, we, we believe this is a first class project. And, um, and we, again, we put it out there for everyone to see. Um, there's not, uh, there's certainly, certainly no hidden ball trick as, since baseball season's right around the corner. Um, we want to uh, be as transparent as we possibly can, but we believe we have done everything we can to meet the standards that are enunciated in the UDO. And if those standards are not correct, and we've talked about changing the mixed use standards many times, but to my knowledge, no text amendment has ever been submitted by either the private sector or the public sector. Um, I hope that answered your question, but, um, and if, the, if you want any further details, then obviously our, our team is here to answer that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I, I too want to thank um, people that have sent emails and sent letters, and I, I, I must say some of the letters were quite creative. Um, and um, and telephone calls that I've received, both for and against. You know, is we can always make a good decision with public input. I'm a firm believer of that, and I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight. Um, I wish that um, we could afford to live um, in a community where there was plenty of land space, where we would have to worry about um, traffic and, and um, development. I've been to Wyoming and I, I saw why the, the rustic atmosphere, um, what was appealing about that. But Durham is gonna grow, whether we like it or not. In fact, I think it's projected to have somewhere close to we're now at quarter of a million, and we and we're gonna grow to four hundred thousand by in eight years, and we must develop. I remember the fight over South Point, and I remember all of the disaster scenarios that people feared. Some of those came true. But the point is that South Point gave us extra revenue as a city to keep our taxes lower. It's not as low as I wanted to be, but because of that development, it made it better. We were able to do different kinds of things as far as recreation and, and traffic calming. Guess Road needs this traffic calming, whether this development is approved or not. And um, I like the idea that it has open space. It means it's not just a big I've heard y'all call it strip, strip mall, but most strip malls do not provide open space. 
and they certainly don't create a path for people to um, walk to, to get their goods and services. I, for one, will vote to approve this measure. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Whitley. Uh, Commissioner Busby. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll also thank everyone for coming tonight. In particular, I really appreciate the work of the staff. I know over the past few days we've gotten numerous updates on this proposal. This is a, um, a proposal that takes a lot of staff time, so we, we appreciate your work. Uh, and certainly appreciate all of you coming out tonight. I think we probably should apologize to Durham restaurants that don't have all of you out taking advantage of Valentine's Day tonight. Uh, and I think we can all agree, and I, I appreciate the respectful debate that we all love Durham, and it's worth reminding ourselves that on Valentine's Day. Uh, the thing that I think is important to recall, and, and Commissioner Alturk, I would agree, we've gotten a lot of emails and letters and phone calls uh, the folks that are saying, please do not rezone this, have raised legitimate concerns about uh, what this might mean and having made investments based on what our current UDO indicated would happen. At the same time, we do make rezonings. Those, those happen. Uh, most of you, I noticed, I went back through all the emails of folks who are in favor of this rezoning, and what it was really interesting to me, about two-thirds of you were very specific in saying, I want the Publix. So good job for Publix for their brand recognition. Our challenge is we aren't here tonight to vote for or against Publix. We are here tonight to vote for or against a rezoning at this particular site. And so um, that leads me to one question actually, Mr. Biker, for you. I've heard some of the citizens who spoke tonight and the, there was a, some pictures of currently zoned commercial vacant land in the North Durham area. And I just wanted to hear your response to the concern that's raised in saying, why this location when there is plenty of adequate commercially zoned property uh, for, for a Publix to come to, to Northern, Northern Durham and, and to provide those services? I, I may ask Tom Vincent to echo some or to reinforce some of these points. It's, it, there's several things, Vice Chairman. One, several of the commercial sites are sites that I've looked at for other projects, and they have had other development challenges that made them simply unfeasible. Now, it could be a water and sewer issue. It could be a rock issue. It could be a topography issue. It, there are a host of issues, and we'd be here for a long time if we went through all those sites and talked about all of them. But trust me, I've looked at many of them, and they all are problematic. So it was not that we said, well, we're not even going to look. We, we, we certainly evaluated them. They were all rejected for perfectly legitimate reasons, which had nothing to do with zoning, but they had to do with the, the challenges. There's a saying, um, to win a horse race, a thousand, a thousand things have to go right. To lose a horse race, only one thing has to go wrong. Well, zoning is just one issue in, in a bring, bringing a successful project uh, to completion. There are a host of other issues. And so those sites that, that other people have referred to have those challenges, and that's why they didn't work. Um, if you want to talk about the trade area, Tom Vincent can go into that more eloquently, but it's mainly because this location serves a huge area to the north and to the west. And that is um, very important because when we, uh, that's why I referenced 2005 when we adopted the plan. That was when we adopted the suburban tier, members of the commission. That sent a signal that this area was going to be developed with water and sewer, and we were going to encourage mixed use within the suburban tier. And so that's why this site was evaluated. Those other, many of those other sites were looked at. Have, I've looked at them. Others on my team have looked at them for, some, for one reason or another, and it would take too long to go through all of them in detail. But uh, trust me, we've looked at, I've looked at them many times over the last 20 years. Great. That's Tom, did you have anything to add on the trade area? That's helpful. Thank if, you. If, if there's anything else, if I didn't address your question, I, I hope I did. But if you need anything else, don't. No, that's great. You, you, you were very helpful. I appreciate it. I had one other question uh, for Ms. Jacobs with the Eno River Association. If you don't mind coming to the microphone, uh, you had mentioned the, the Eno River assessment was taking place. And I was curious. I may have missed this. You may have said this. What's the timing on this Actually, report? this is the third one that I think the city has done. They did Ellery Creek and Little Lick Creek, I think, was the second one. They're now working on Eno, and they're out 
actually walking around and looking at creeks and the land conditions on the Eno. There's a preliminary report that'll be um, presented, I believe, in the middle of March as part of Creek Week. There's a public information. I don't know yet whether, I doubt if that's the final report. It's a public information session. So I don't really know how long it'll be before this is completed, but certainly staff is working with consultants, so. Okay, great, that's, that's helpful. That's the next step. I've been sitting on that question ever since you testified. Uh, thank you, and I have to say that having heard so many folks in support of this proposal, I would love to say I'm gonna stand here tonight and, and vote for it and allow the publics to come, but as Commissioner Bryan and, and Commissioner Alturk have, have raised concerns, I share those same concerns about is this the appropriate site? Is this truly a mixed, uh, mixed use development? Uh, seeing some of the concerns raised in the staff report give me pause in supporting this project. So I, I know my time is up, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Busby. Commissioner Gibbs. Well, I think I may as well chime in on the mixed use thing to start with. Uh, outside of the downtown district, the Ninth Street, uh, mixed use does have a definition that seems to follow all the way out to the county. Uh, commercial on the first floor, residential up above, regardless. But when we get out to suburban areas uh, and even areas within the town limits, uh, I think we're gonna, we, we really need to reevaluate uh, the term mixed use. Uh, to me, this project is a good example of a mixed use project. Uh, if you apply the downtown tier uh, rules of mixed use, that means somewhere in there you're going to have have to live above the grocery store or live above the the uh, uh, whatever restaurants may be coming in. But uh, having said that, I I just think we need to reevaluate uh, in our, our our comp plan. Uh, a more flexible definition of what uh, that allows some creativity in uh, mixed use development. But I, I, that aside, there is this is another really hard one. I, I'll be glad when some easy ones come along. Uh, Everybody that I, that I have heard from, or that we have heard from, their reasons for being for or against have, have merit some things that I agree with on both sides. Uh, this is a, to me, if this, this project is a really good project, uh, it has one of the the best home builders uh, in Cimarron, Publix has its reputation, which regardless of the cynicism that I have heard from lots of folks, uh, and that's something I'm gonna ask about too, uh, and I, we don't know what kind of restaurants may be coming, but it, it has the potential to be a really, good project, not a strip mall. And I think it, it would make a nice little village there it, with the school nearby. But that's, I didn't really mean to get into that. One thing that has come through in a lot of the things is the, the distrust of the developer distrust and cynicism in describing uh, publics. 
and we don't even know that a Publix is going to come in there, and that's a problem I have. Uh, I'd, that's been an issue in my mind. The traffic concerns, I think, there will not be any, any traffic remediation if this project is not built. And if this project is not built, it will remain RS-20. And I, if you think there's a lot of traffic associated with this, think about a 130 unit or a unit that matches Lattimore across the street. Now, that can give you a whole bunch of traffic and impact. But as far as development further out, further north, there ain't going to be any except for small developments, well, and any kind of residential developments. Uh, nobody wants to be ac annexed into the city <coughs> so that water and sewer can be run out. S but And if it does, then you will see development take off to uh, a certain extent since it's in the, the uh, not the news, the, uh, the Falls Lake, Little River Basin, and all of those other things. And I, uh, these are just some random thoughts that I've had, but I, whatever happens uh, in the vote tonight, I really don't, would not like to see uh, a celebration against any of our other neighbors because we are neighbors. I am, I live in the northern, northern Durham. Uh, and I'll end my comments uh, with a question, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, regardless of what the vote is tonight, this will go to, to the city for their review and and action on that is correct that is correct okay and that's because I the ultimate uh, decision on this I think should be made by elected officials but um, thank you Commissioner all. Gibbs Commissioner Freeman Thank you. Uh, I also want to echo the um, thanks for all of the feedback and the insight in the area around uh, comments, questions, even just detailed rundown of what, what folks were feeling in, on this case. I um, want to step back from this conversation and say that this split in the community marks what I've been talking about on a number of cases in that we don't have a neighborhood level planning process in place to make sure that we're planning together rather than on this piecemeal when developers choose to move forward with a project. So I just wanted to say that up front. And then I, I had a few questions um, and I'm not sure, I don't see Mr. Stephen Woods who mentioned um, the noise and light pollution but I wanted to know if, um, if, I guess, if you could speak to it, Mr. Biker, um, if that was brought up previously and if you had any thoughts on it. Uh, yes, certainly the UDO has very stringent standards on, on light pollution, and obviously this project will abide by them. And then in terms of um, noise, I'm sorry, in terms of odor, other things, I, I can tell you, I live, uh, I can smell Q shag off of my my wife and I smell it every day when we go outside, and it's part of living in a in a in Durham. I, I love it. Um, other people might not, but they're they're. But getting to that to address that point, that's something where obviously we're going to locate all the uh, the service areas are going to be located quite far away from um, the existing homes. They would be placed between uh, behind the. Um, 
uh, commercial area, and that way we can plan accordingly for the new houses that are built. So we have looked at that. I mean, this is getting into a site plan issue, but obviously to address that concern since it came up, we, had, we did think about it. Uh, we, we've been as proactive as we can to uh, design a project that uh, has as little impact as possible on uh, the surrounding houses. Thank you. Thank you. And then also, um, I know it was Sherry DeFries or Megan that uh, talked about the mixed use or the property that came up in 2003, and then what were the differences between this before and now? I'm not sure which one of you it was, I, I know, but uh, if you could just speak to that again, I, I couldn't catch. Uh, there was something about suitability that I missed, and I just wanted to catch, on, catch up on that. Sorry. Yeah, so in 2003, um, Ken Spaulding and AAC developers out of Charlotte proposed um, half, half the size, so 15 acres, but it was the 15 acres of commercial that you basically see in the plan now. So if you take away the residential portion, you only get the commercial portion. That's what they had proposed. Okay. With the grocery store, with other stores and out parcels, it's pretty much exactly the same. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And just um, just to touch on, I think um, sorry you got for staff a question for staff. I'm, because I'm recognizing that this area is a is not urban, is in downtown Durham, as um, Mr. Gibbs, Commissioner Gibbs mentioned. For a rural transition into suburban, what does mixed use mean? Or in your in your analysis of it, what exactly does that mean? Sure. Um, Jacob Lincoln's with the planning department. So I mean, this, this property is located within the suburban tier. Um, so the, the comprehensive plan uh, does permit the mixed use district within the suburban tier. Um, the, and by extension, therefore, when we look at the ordinance for technical compliance, it is a permitted district within the suburban tier. Um, in terms of what that means, um, staff follows the comprehensive plan policies and the language in the ordinance when we're reviewing it. So specifically, I know I heard someone else mention uh, horizontal versus vertical mm -hmm. mixed use. Is sure. that factored in at all? Sure. So that's in the, yeah. Um, so there's two options for the mixed use district. Um, there's horizontal integration or there's vertical integration. And they, they are what they sound like. Vertical integration, um, you typically see non-commercial uses on lower floors and residential above. Horizontal is something that allows for a horizontal um, approach the applicant in this case has taken that approach and um, is there a preference in this suburban tier around planning for the future mm -hmm. sure um, so the the ordinance does not specify it's an option that the the applicant it's at their discretion in terms of their design thank you mm -hmm. and so I just want to step back and again and say that I think that this is the type of issue that could be addressed in a more neighborhood level um, planning session and it doesn't feel right, like Commissioner Gibbs said, for me to make the decision on whether or not this project should move forward, knowing that it doesn't fit with the existing neighborhood, and it would create a huge shift in, I guess, where the commercial mixed-use projects would go going forward. So I just want to be uh, mindful of that and saying that I just don't feel comfortable with it, and I, I think it would be great to have a public in Northern Durham. I'm not sure that this is the right property. I'm not, I can't say that for certain in this case based on um, Mr. Um, Commissioner Bryan and Commissioner Alteric's uh, comments. Those were also my concerns as well. I, I just didn't feel comfortable, that's all. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Freeman. Do I have other commissioners who would like to speak? Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> you're last. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Johnson. Okay, Thank and you. Commissioner uh, Hornbuckle. Sure. Of course, uh, Commissioner Miller will, will, will drive us home. Uh, just to be short, I just wanted to, to make sure that I thank everyone for one, reaching out over the, what seems like the past month with um, your correspondence for, uh, in support or uh, in opposition to this. This is a hard case uh, application. Uh, I share the sentiment of, of Commissioner Freeman in that I don't necessarily feel comfortable making decisions with, uh, with something that I feel is more of a neighborhood uh, level uh, conversation decision to be made. Um, 
So uh, mo nearly all of the concerns that have been raised are, were notes that I made. So there's positives to this, this project and there are negatives. So if, if the issue is traffic, you're probably not going to get traffic from a public investment standpoint. So this would be an opportunity to do it. Uh, this, uh, this notion of bringing economic development to North, North Durham is, you know, this is not, one can make an argument, this is an opportunity to do that. Uh, the one point that I do, I would like to, to speak to tonight is that when, it, when we've had pr prior applications and just like tonight, you know, we, we commonly hear that Durham is growing and we got to do something with the growth. But the reality is, is that we have a choice of what we're going to do in regards to Durham and growth. And we don't just have to accept it as an inevitable thing. So that's why we're addressing issues like affordable housing and where we're uh, going to invest transportation dollars. And so the question becomes, what do we want Durham to look like? We have a comprehensive plan. We have the UDOs, et cetera, et cetera. And the question is, is it going to be a vision that we just change when we want to make something when we want to rationalize why something makes sense, or do we stay with the vision of Durham does not have to be a, a, a city where we pack people into downtown Durham and South Durham like we've chosen to. Those are the, the, the populous areas that we've chosen to drive economic development in an intense way. North Durham doesn't necessarily have to be that way, even though we're growing. And that's something that we just have to be, you know, adults and humans about and do the hard work of figuring out what is Durham going to look like 10, 20, 30 years from now. So I'll conclude with saying that my concerns are to the point that I don't feel comfortable just uh, so saying that I support this project in the sense that I'm looking at this more from a, a public servant standpoint in that you can look at the project on its own and see the positives but then what does it look like from a community standpoint from the what's the net benefit so it is very likely I'm an economic development guy I'm an analyst so I, I look at data to help drive my decisions in that it's very likely that one of I drove the area this is this has taken up a lot of my mental space and energy over the past two and a half weeks so I've drove the, the area and I've noticed you know there are gross, multiple grocery stores in a close proximity not all, not all of them are going to likely stay there because the market is just not going to support four or five grocery stores. So what happens when, so what's the net job impact? That's the question. So you may create 100 jobs with a grocery store that you're going to bring with the Publix, but what happens when one, one or two of them go away? What's the net impact of that? And the reality is from an economic development financing standpoint is that it's very costly to do infill with big open storefronts like grocery stores that close down. So who's going, how, how are you feeling as a, as a community, a local level community, and the ability of someone who's going to be willing to come in North Durham and actually put in the capital necessary to turn a huge grocery storefront or whatever it is into something 21st century? Do you take that risk or do you do a project like this that's much easier? And I'll just be honest with you. This project is much easier than going and trying to do an infill with something that's been developed. And so I put those comments to my commissioners in the sense that this is the reality. Like we, we want to do things for Durham and we know North Durham has, challenge, has challenges and issues and concerns just like East Durham and other parts of the city. But what's best when we look at it from a what's the net benefit for, for not just the neighborhood and the community level, but what we're trying to do for Durham and making it an, a magnet for people who want to come. Because we'll get to a point where you just can't come to Durham because we ain't got no more room. you know. So we can't just use that we're growing, so we have to make these decisions to, to accommodate growth. I think that we should see this as an opportunity for us to have a, converse, a larger conversation of what do we want our Durham to look like going forward. And so I'll close with those remarks. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Hornbuckle. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Black, I'd like to thank you. I, I think you have presented a, a quality development. I'm a lifelong resident of Northern Durham County, and I really think it is something that is needed in Northern Durham County, and you have my support for it. Uh, I, I think that the only way uh, people complain, I'm a retired deputy sheriff. I know the traffic problems at, at Guests and Ladder very, very well. Investigated many accidents at that intersection. Uh, your development is going to be probably the only way there is going to be any uh, uh, help or, or alleviate the problem there, or, or, or at least something to uh, attempt to uh, help the problem. So, you know, I'm going on record and as, as I'm in full support of this project. Thank you. 
Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The first thing I want to address in this is what appears to be a misunderstanding about uh, the traffic impact of the project and the effect of the traffic improvements that the developer pro proposes to make. And I'm relying almost entirely on Appendix 10 in the staff report, and I'm looking at page 5 here. This project is expected to add uh, 10,270 some, some trips per day. Uh, that's 103 percent of the current traffic generation. Now that's not as the traffic today, that's the traffic calculated against the way the land is zoned and if it were developed. So right now this, if this R20 piece of property was developed, it would generate 500 trip, and 80 trips per day. So if we subtract that out of the 10 to 70 or whatever it is, it comes up to uh, something under 10,000. And so they have added traffic improvements, substantial ones, uh, at the, mainly at the Latta and Guess intersection. Today, it's working that intersection uh, as if this property was developed with single family homes at a level of service C with all the improvements at, if this project is developed out it'll be working at a level of service C. That's a zero-sum game. It's, it's be, we're going to be right where we are. Uh, but that's not the whole story. Uh, we have other roads and other intersections that we have to measure. One is Autumn Drive. Currently, it's functioning at levels of service C. Uh, if we build this project with the proposed improvements, it drops to level of service D. In the morning and level of service E, in the afternoon. That's much worse with the improvements. Ladder Road and Green Oak Drive. Today, level of service B in the morning, level of service B in the afternoon. With the improvements, drops to level of service C in the morning, level of service D in the afternoon. So the traffic improvements are necessary just to tread water and keep it the way it is with double the traffic volume. So the project really doesn't it doesn't make it substantially worse, but it does not make it better. And I think we have to be honest uh, with ourselves about that. Uh, we, if you're in favor of this project because it makes traffic better, you're mistaken. Look at your staff report, Appendix 10, page 5. Um, Mr. Gibbs talked about mixed-use development. He cited downtown and Ninth Street. There's actually no mixed-use zoning in Ninth Street or downtown. Those are design districts and different, completely different uh, standards apply. Uh, I am uh, persuaded actually by something Mr. Plord said, and that is this is a litmus test on the comprehensive plan. And the question is, are we as a community serious about comprehensive planning? Do we have the discipline as a community to follow the comprehensive plan? I have been on the planning commission for about three and a half, four years, and I have been involved in zoning matters uh, here in Durham and across the state for over 30 years. Uh, and uh, this is one of the few instances where I've seen the staff come out and say, look at the intent statements, let's really look at our policies, and it says basically uh, this project doesn't measure up. One, it's not mixed use. In other words, if this rezoning was submitted as a, I mean we could get the same project essentially if we had a rezoning for a CG uh, on the front half and didn't do anything on the back half, and we would say, no, it doesn't conform with the comprehensive plan because the comprehensive plan says this is supposed to be low-density low residential. But somehow we, we cast it as mixed use, and it's exactly the same project, and somehow we say it is, but it's not mixed use. Uh, the staff says in the staff report that the development plan is so sparse they can't tell whether or not what's being proposed to be built here on the commercial side is consistent with uh, nodal development or with strip development. Um, and I think that we can't vote in favor of this unless we can answer that question. Uh, I, we can't vote in favor of this because we violate our own policy on commercial nodes. And I have been pounding the table here ever since I've been on the Planning Commission about what commercial nodes means. If we're not careful, we will wind up with a gas road north of the Eno River looking like Guess Road south of the Eno River and Roxborough Road from I-85 all the way up to 
to, to Infinity Road. A mishmash of piecemeal commercial zoning, the new, things are new, are great when they're new, and then they begin to decay, and instead of going back and fixing those, we take another green field and we put it in a new strip shopping center. It's kind of slash and burn development. And that's what this is, and we shouldn't do it. Guess Road, we've got to have discipline. We've got to make sure that Guess Road going north doesn't become an endless uh, uh, succession of disconnected commercial development. And we have a policy about it. It's called the, the commercial node policy, and that says no closer than half mile. But this is much less than half a mile from the next commercial node up the street. So under that policy, even if you decided this was mixed use, we have to vote no. We have to vote no. That's what we're here for. We're here to apply the policies. That's what our city council and our board of county commissioners wants us to do. We hear from the community and we apply the policies. Um, uh, I was invited along with uh, Commission Member Brian uh, to uh, Mr. Biker's office uh, to look at a uh, a uh, possible development plan for this, and what they showed was a strip shopping center with a parking lot out in front and a couple of sites reserved for potential restaurant sites, a buffer, and then a single-family home development. Um, that's, that's ordinary. It's a 1960s approach to land use development. That's not mixed use. And I heard uh, the staff say, well, they will have a footpath. Well, some, there's something wrong with our ordinance. If projects become mixed use because you've added a sidewalk between them. That's not what mixed use is. And we, and while it may be possible under the code, we don't have to approve it and we certainly don't have to approve it and say it's appropriate in a place where our comprehensive plan says this should be low density residential uh, and it's zoned low density residential. So for these reasons, um, I've got to vote against this, and I know this is going to disappoint some of you folks who live further out. My observation is, is about 50-50, for and against. The people who were against tended to live closer. The people who were for tended to live further out. Do I hear you, you folks who live further out, about how difficult it is to find places to shop and to eat? Yes, and we can say, well, that was a choice you made. I don't think that's really an adequate answer. But I will point out to you that the comprehensive plan isn't some, a, a map that's a, a mile around this site. It's the whole county. And I encourage you to look at it because we have reserved commercial shopping center sites. They're zoned and ready to go um, here and there. Now, we're dependent upon the development community to, to decide today is the day to do it. But there are at least three com shopping center sites uh, in Treyburn right now. Uh, and I don't know what the developer's plans are for developing those sites, but one day that's going to happen. And I'm sure it has to do with market analysis. Um, and so, and all, some of it has to do with water and sewer. There are a lot of things that have to come together, but discipline, we have to have community discipline. And in this situation, we've got to follow our plan. The plan makes sense. It's a good one. Uh, if we're going to have a shopping center here, then let's have it at an appropriate commercial node further up guess. And if somebody comes along and wants to propose that, I want to seriously look at it. But I do not want to crowd nodes, and I do not want to have a commercial node every time a street intersects with a thoroughfare like Guess Road. So uh, to my colleagues on the Commission, I'm going to vote against this. I urge you to vote against it for the same reasons. Uh, this isn't the end and the, the beginning and the end of, of the development question in North Durham, but we're going to have better development and development that makes more sense if we follow our policies and we follow our plans. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Uh, before I call for the point of order, please, before I call for uh, the vote, I'd like to make um, an observation and a comment. Um, I am so appreciative to all of you for participating in the process. It is important that you take the time, whether you're for or against the project, to come out and be heard. So many of you took the opportunity to do this, and I could not go this evening without saying how important it is to have input into these processes. So thank you all for coming, and now I'm going to call for a motion.
Madam Chair, if I may, I'd like to make a motion. As was mentioned by uh, Commissioner Gibbs raised the question, it's worth pointing out, we are an advisory body. We will, um, we will make a favorable motion to send this forward to the City Council. It will then move forward to the City Council regardless, but with our notes and our votes. So having said that, I move that we send case number Z1500040 to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Can you hear me now? Yes. I would like to request uh, 30 days of review. I would like to know if um, Mr. Biker might be uh, opposed to that before I say it. This is a substitute motion, so do I have? Yes, a substitute. I have, uh, isn't this the 90 days? Didn't we? No, we've not no. had this one before. No, no. this is the first. Okay. Yeah, this is the first. So I just want to make sure that there are. Let me I'm be sure I have a, uh, a motion by Commissioner Freeman and a second by Commissioner. Whitley. Oh, I did. Okay. A second by Commissioner Miller. Whitley. No, Whitley. Whitley. Whitley? Okay. I'm <laughs> sorry that we um, continue. continue this item for an additional 30 days. I'm going to call for a roll call. A vote on the substitute motion first. Yeah, I voted on the substitute motion first. So roll call for the substitute motion. No. 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 Yes. No. Yes. No. Mr. Johnson? No. Mr. Kenton? Yes. Mr. Miller? No. Mr. Van? Yes. Call for the question uh, again. Right. Well, uh, the original question I believe is on the table, but just to repeat it, we uh, move case number Z1500040 to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. If I didn't hear a second. No, don't have a second. Okay. Okay, Mr. Alter. I need to do it again. <laughs> uh, motion by Commissioner Busby. Second by Commissioner Al Turk that we move North River Village item number 71500040 forward with a favorable rec uh, recommendation. All in favor of this motion, roll call vote, please. Mr. Alter? No. Mr. Brown? No. Mr. Busby? No. Ms. Freeman? No. No. Mr. Harris? No. Mr. Warnock? Yes. Ms. Hines? No. Mr. Johnson? No. Mr. Kenton? No. Mr. Miller? No. Mr. Van? No. Mr. Whitley? Yes. Thank you. I'm going to ask for a five minute recess.
I'm trying to get that. It's a bunch of crap is what it is. It is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. I think you're right. I it think is. You it's ridiculous. It's, 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 it's absolutely it's ridiculous. I'm trying to get that thing back. I'm trying to get that thing back. I'm trying to get that thing back. Well, I'm going to go down and play. Well, I'm going to go down and play.
coming, I'm coming. Let's continue with our agenda. The next item on the agenda is Fendel Farms. Follow assemblage. Uh, staff report, please. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, so this case is for Pendle Farms um, and Fowler Assemblage. The applicant is Bob Zumwalt with McAdams. This is within the city's jurisdiction. This is a request to change the zoning designation of approximately 423 acres um, from plan development residential 3.000 to plan development residential 2.903. Um, the applicant is proposing, as part of this uh, residential development, a range of 1,000 to 1,200 residential units. The subject site is highlighted in red in front of you. Um, this is located, um, the primary street frontage is along Leesville Road, along the southern border of the site. Along the western border of the site, um, you'll find Doc Nichols Road. Um, this is in the southeastern part of Durham County. Directly to the south of the subject site is portions of the Del Webb Arbors development. Um, as I noted, the applicant is requesting a PDR district um, for approximately 423 acres with a range of 1,000 to 1,200 residential units at the subject site. Uh, the maximum impervious coverage, as noted on the development plan, is broken down by each property. The Fowler tract is proposed at 60% impervious surface, and the Fennel Farm tract is noted at 24% impervious surfaces. And the maximum height of any of the residential structures would be 35 feet. Uh, the existing conditions, as shown on the development plan, um, this is for the portion of the property which is located to the north. Um, as you can see, the site is traversed by a number of riparian features. Um, this is similar uh, on the existing conditions to the south. Um, you can also see on this existing conditions there are a number of lots which are, have already been platted at the subject site as part of previous approvals. The proposed conditions, again this is looking at the northern portion of the property. As you can see the plans um, note potential stream crossings, um, access points, as well as an internal roadway network. And the southern portion notes very similarly the potential stream crossings, exterior access points, as well as an interior road connection. So to summarize some of the commitments, I noted the, the residential uh, density. The applicant is also proposing this to be age restricted, um, th those living 55 or older. Um, they're proposing for what they're calling pocket parks as a proper commitment. Um, access points to the subject site, as well as a building and parking envelope. Um, as part of the TIA with this request, there are roadway improvements required along Leesville Road, Doc Nichols Road, Highway 98, and Olive Branch Road. 
And then as you saw in the development plan, there are riparian buffers and the associated um, requirements for those are shown. In terms of design commitments, um, no architectural style has been chosen. Um, all units will have covered porches and or stoops and front or side facing entrance doors. Uh, there will be pitched roofs, um, one or more exterior building surface materials as noted in the staff report and the applicant has not committed to any distinct architectural features for this project. The future land use map designates the entire site as low density residential um, and that is comparable to the parcels directly adjacent which are also noted as low density residential. Comprehensive plan policies reviewed um, by staff when looking at this proposal are in front of you um, and at this time um, staff determines that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances and I'm happy to answer any questions that the Commission may have at this time. Thank you. I have two individuals who have signed up to speak. Uh, Patrick Biker and Mr. Zumwalt. And Mr. Bob Zumwalt. Good evening again, Chairwoman Hyman, Vice Chair Busby, members of the Planning Commission. I'm Patrick Biker. I still live at 2614 Stewart Drive. And I think I'm still an attorney with Morningstar Law Group in Durham. I'll have to check on that. Um, I'm here tonight re representing Rialto Capital for this zoning map change. With me tonight are Ame Carlson, who is a director with Rialto, our traffic engineer Earl Llewellyn with Cunley Horn, and our landscape, landscape architect Bob Zumwalt with McAdams. The best way to think about this rezoning request is that we are taking the existing zoning and adding conditions to it to make the overall development less intense. The primary way we are doing that is by committing to an 80% age-restricted community. This is expected to create far less traffic and far fewer students when compared to the existing zoning. The result is that the impact on the public infrastructure is far less. It is important to understand that we are not asking for more houses than the existing zoning allows. We are not asking for a change in the type of use. It's still completely residential. Uh, we've retained the condition relating to phased grading. Uh, we've retained the condition relating to signage. And we've retained the condition related to pocket parks. However, we have uh, uh, changed uh, one thing, that being that the commitment to an 80% age-restricted community. In conjunction with that, with that, we've had to submit a new TIA and we have adjusted the road improvements based on new developments in the area and the traffic expected from the proposed development. Traffic patterns have changed in this area with the build out of the Carolina Arbors community. And so some of the previously suggested road improvements no longer make sense. The new road improvements, uh, which have been reviewed and approved by NCDOT and the City of Durham, respect the new traffic patterns and accommodate the new traffic that is expected. Ultimately, this rezoning will result in a less intense use than what is currently permitted as of right for this 400 plus acre assemblage. In addition to that, this rezoning addresses an important market trend. It is no secret that our population is getting older. In fact, the fastest growing segment of Durham's population is age 55 to 74. I'm almost in that. Um, accordingly, the need for age targeted housing has grown. As we have seen, age-restricted communities are doing very well here in Durham. We believe this development will be no different in that regard. Accordingly, we hope you will support this request so we can provide a fine neighborhood where our aging population can enjoy a great sense of community. Uh, Mr. Bob Zumwalt would briefly like to address uh, one technical issue for the record and then our team will be happy to answer any questions. We hope this is the easy project that one of you just uh, mentioned uh, a few minutes ago that you want to get an easy project we think this is it. Good evening again, Bob Zumwalt with McAdams, 2905 Meridian Parkway in Durham. Just a quick clarification, um, I just wanted to have it on the record. Text commitment number eight, uh, prior to the issuance of a building permit, comma, dedicate an additional 10 feet of right of way through the rest. Uh, a phrase was left out of that to make it clear. It should have said prior to issuance of a building permit on the Fowler track. There's a little piece of frontage up on the Fowler track, and we just wanted to make sure that that was clear. We've talked to Bill Judge about it and the staff, and we just wanted to make that clarification. And we'll add that to the text. We just don't want it to get misinterpreted a year from now. So that was it. I just wanted to mention that. I do not have individuals who have signed up to speak against, so I'm going to close the public <laughs> hearing. 
and give our commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. I'll start to my Commissioner Miller. No one on this side. Commissioner Miller. Commissioner Harris. So I'm going to remark out loud at the hearing today uh, some of the remarks I made when I visited your office, Patrick, and spoke with your clients about uh, this proposed change. Um, I think we're all becoming a lot more sensitive to uh, PDR rezonings uh, and, and mixed-use rezonings uh, when they come along and how they compare to our uh, policies that are stated uh, not only in the comprehensive plan but also in the intent statements in the UDO. And one of the things that I would like to see in this project, because it is so big, are some design commitments that, uh, about the way these units would look, something that would reassure us uh, and show that we're serving the policies in the comprehensive plan concerning uh, monotony and development and also repetitious placement of garages. I would love uh, if you could add those things to this. Other developers in projects in uh, recent months have uh, began to introduce those commitments um, to the development plans that we've been seeing. Uh, now, having said that, I intend to vote for this, whether you include that or not. I note that this is a little bit different in that it is an already approved project uh, that has an approved site plan. It's already, part of it's already been through subdivision review. That's a long way down the street to start asking for a lot of changes. Uh, but I, I did want to take this opportunity to throw that out and say I think the project would be better with those commitments. Um, and I also want to make sure that when developers come with big PDRs that I am treating them all the same way and feeding them from the same spoon. So thank you very much. I understand the changes that you're going to make. I will vote in favor of this project. Commissioner Harris. I have a question and it's for staff. Uh, I'm looking under the tax commitments Under age restrictions, yes, and sir. my concern is, <laughs> my concern is occupied owning unit must be occupied by one applicant who is at least 55 or older. Is that language from the applicant? Is that language within, my concern is, as long as someone's staying there this whole 55, then anybody, they can have as many as they want, as long as one person is over 55, whether they're the owner or not. Sure. Um, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. So this language that you see in the staff report is directly from the development plan. Uh, my understanding is that is correct, um, but I would likely defer to the applicant to clarify that, if that is the intent of this commitment. The, Bob Zemo again, the, the um, it's dramatically cut down to two lines versus the four paragraphs on the development plan. So if you look at the development plan, that condition is, you know, give or take a thousand words versus the 10 that are in the staff report. <laughs> so I would look at the, what's on the development plan. It's much more restrictive and it just follows the, it follows the, um, the Federal Housing for Older Persons Act of 1995. So we took it straight from that. I wouldn't, Mission, I wouldn't expect the staff to put all that sure. in their staff report. And so, yeah, <laughs> Jacob thing, Wiggins, just yeah. for a point of clarification, it is actually all in the staff report in, in attachment seven. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, language. but you were just uh, reading you really summary, can't. I, I can't read. It. We know yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, I'm over fifty-five. <laughs> I can't read. It. <laughs> okay. Are there other commissioners who would like to speak to this issue? If not. I'll enter. Madam Chairman, I move that the Planning Commission send case Z1600019 forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. And this is a city jurisdiction case. Thank you. Second. Motion by, motion by Commissioner Miller uh, that we send item Z1600019 
Second, by Commissioner Van Ford with a favorable rec uh, recommendation. All in favor of this motion, uh, roll call. Yes. 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 Mr. Hornbuckle? Yes. Ms. Hyman? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Yes. Thank you. Um, the next item that we have is Andrew, Ch Andrew Chapel, item number Z160024. Staff report, please. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case number Z160024, Andrews Chapel. Uh, before I start my presentation, I just wanted to point out to the Planning Commission a couple minor typos from the staff report. Page two, top paragraph, should read 100 to 350 single family units. Page two, under D, Consistency, second paragraph at the end should be attachment nine, not appendix eight. And under attachment nine, the reference should be policy number 8.1.2H, not 8.12J. The applicant is Jeremy Midlin, M.I. Holmes of Raleigh. The application is located within the city's jurisdiction. The applicant requests to rezone the 114.17 acre site from Plan Development Residential 4.793 zoning with Plan Development Residential 4.437. The applicant proposes 500 residential units consisting of townhomes and single family development. This site had an existing zoning case which was approved by the City Council on June 1st, 2015, through a legacy case, which was Z140006, um, also known as Briar Creek Assemblage. There was an approved annexation and utility extension agreement uh, in March of 2015. Essentially, the applicant is seeking a modification of the original rezoning case to allow more flexibility in the number of townhome units and enlarge the townhome building envelope. It should also be noted that subsequent to the prior application, state statute has been amended and the stream buffer areas can now be included in calculating, calculating the density of a site. As shown on the context map, there are four parcels highlighted in red. The address is 409, 507, 511, and 735 Andrews Chapel Road. It is located on the south side of Andrews Chapel Road, east of Del Webb Arbors Drive. One of the parcels is located beyond the, Dake, the Durham Wake County line, and the property is located in the suburban tier. The site satisfies the criteria of the PDR district as highlighted in this side, slide and in the staff report. Under the existing conditions map, you'll see that the property is vacant with a combination of farm meadows and hardwood forests. Water features on the site include three farm ponds and two intermittent streams. The property is adjacent to Andrews Place, which includes large-scale commercial and residential developments to the south, and to the west is a planned development residential application, 
to the northwest is also another planned development residential application. And the Planning Commission recently approved a um, 149 lot single family subdivision, uh, PDR 3.172 off of Leesville Road to the northwest. The proposed commitments, uh, I'm sorry, the proposed conditions map shows the access points to the site, the location of the buildings and parking envelope, the general location of tree protection areas, and the project meets the requirements of a planned development for PDR zoning district. The applicant proposes 500 residential units with a mix of single family and townhomes. Uh, the single family range is 100 to 350 units with townhomes being 150 to 400 units. They have committed to a minimum lot size of 3,500 for 3,500 square feet for single family lots. The development plans show the construction of the Briar Creek, Creek Parkway extension with bicycle lanes, sidewalks, additional asphalt for future bicycle lanes on Andrews Chapel Road, as well as another, a number of other roadway improvements. Prior to the site plan application, a street closing application for a portion of Andrews Chapel Road will be submitted. Prior to the final plot approval, a one-time payment of 60,500 will be made to the Durham Public Schools for additional students. Just gonna summarize some of the design commitments that the applicant has included on the development plan. No architectural style has been chosen, but each building will contain sloped or flat roofs with a combination of fiberglass shingles, asphalt shingles, or standing seam metal. Each building will, will utilize one or more of the um, building materials, stone, brick, stucco, cement board, siding, or vinyl siding. And front facing gables, entry porches, or window shutters are the archite architectural features proposed. The request is consistent with the future land use map, which identifies this area as low, medium, density residential and recreation open space. Staff, staff has determined that the proposal is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the po policies outlined in this slide. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plans and the applicable pol policies and ordinances. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, um, I do have two individuals. I have um, Chris Meal, who has signed up to speak for the project. Did I pronounce that correctly? It's male, just okay. like the mailman. All right, very good, thank you. Yes, my name is Chris Mail. I'm a civil engineer, professional engineer with Eden's Land, offices at 2314 South Miami Boulevard here in Durham. Also with me this evening, Mr. John Blackley, a, a registered landscape architect, also with our office, and Mr. Jeremy Medlin with MI Homes. Um, as the staff stated, a simple building envelope move to allow MI Homes to uh, place townhomes on a larger portion of the site that's, that's currently zoned. We have site plan approval, uh, the first phase of the project, which is all townhomes, we have construction document approval and utility permits under construction. Phase two, single family. Also, CD approval, utility permits obtained, and that will start construction very shortly. Um, here to answer any questions you might have. Thanks. Thank you. Are there other people who would like to speak for? You have two other individuals with you. If not, I will move to, I have two individuals who would like to speak against. Um, Jeff Emmons and Ken Ray. Hey, good evening. Thank I'm, you. Sure, no problem. My name is Jeff Emmons. 
Uh, I live at 4821 Boulder Creek Lane in Raleigh. And I'm here today as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Montessori School of Raleigh. And we have a 40 acre campus that is directly across the street from this project. Um, if you see on the map, our campus has been totally engulfed by the Dell Webb, the previous project and everything else. We're sort of an island there. Um, our issue today is not so much with what they can do with the rezoning on their lot size, but that they own 100 and some odd acres across the street from us. And if you look at their existing conditions map, they did not include the main entrance into our school campus. And I'm not sure if that was uh, done intentionally or not, but what has happened is one of their proposed access points does not line up with our driveway. And the city and the DOT require that driveways be a minimum of 400 feet apart. And their driveway currently is shown only about 150 feet away from our driveway. They have to widen it, they have to do tapers in the turn lane. And as you, if you've ever been in this condition before and you have a driveways that do not quite meet up, it's a total disaster. Uh, we have a whole bunch of kids, moms, school buses. We have an athletic field. We have 40 acres. We have plans to grow our school. We've been there for almost 20 years. So on this little Andrews Chapel Road, we were pretty much the only thing there. Um, and so I'm not sure why our driveway could not have been worked around. It's the only access. It's the only driveway we currently have to use our school. And so I come today asking that that we get these roads to meet the standards that Durham puts out and the DOT puts out such that we do not create this terrible situation with playing chicken in the suicide lane uh, turning into the campus. Um, so that's all I have to say about that. And I'm glad to answer any further questions or talk about it anymore. But I just wanted to highlight that that is not shown on there. Thank you. I have no other individual signed up to speak, so I'm going to give commissioners. Well, he's not here. Oh, what, you sure? I will, I'll ask Probably. again. Ken Ray? All right. I think he signed on the wrong sheet because yeah, okay. he was here earlier. So we'll close the public hearing now and give the commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. Are there commissioners who would like to speak? I'll start. Commissioner Bryan. I have a question for uh, transportation. Uh, you, you've heard what was just stated about the driveway to the Montessori school and how it doesn't seem to line up. What can be done to address that? Um, yeah, Bill Judge with transportation. The um, Really, unfortunately, there's not much that can be done at this point. The um, As they, they stated, the, the driveways are offset. Um, this project was previously rezoned and has site plan approval where they've established that, that access point at the time it was rezoned. Well, it still is currently. I think the school has probably less than 50 students, so there wasn't probably as much thought or detail put into that offset. The school has since contacted us and NCDOT about uh, looking at opportunities to expand the school, and as part of that expansion, that's where we, we identified this potential problem with the offset. But um, the school's pretty well hemmed in on by, by Dell Webb, so that they, they don't really have an opportunity to, to relocate the driveway to line up. And um, the this access point location's already been previously approved by NCDOT, so we'll just have to manage it the best we can. Um, well, thank you for that. I don't know that it helps anybody. Uh, I also have one more question for staff. Uh, this doesn't seem to be a very big change, but I noticed that a piece of this property goes over into Wake County. Does this proposal have to also go through a rezoning in Wake County? No, this, this uh, has already gone through the annexation process. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Miller. 
So my question is for the developer. If you guys could come to the mic. I mean, I was out there at the, your property, uh, and it's it looks like you're clearing and grading. There's nothing built. Uh, is there some way that you can adjust uh, your access points to address the problem that, uh, that your neighbors at the Montessori school just uh, raised? Uh, un unfortunately, I think you know we're just so far down the line that you know trying trying to make an adjustment in the in the layout of, of where that access point is. Uh, you know, that would take us all back through the site plan process. You know, they're ready pretty much within the next week or so to start going vertical with, with homes. Um, so we will, we will cooperate as, as, as much as we can with-, well, with But what does that mean? Help me understand what cooperating as much as you can means. If you, got, if you don't mind, my name is Jeremy Medlin. I'm the applicant. I did not sign in to speak. No, that's fine. If you've got an answer would, to the I question, like we want to hear it. And, and shine some more light on this. Uh, what Chris was stating is that it, our first 63 townhomes are already under development. Those lots are already platted. Those homes have already been permitted. So we are far, far down the road on that portion of the project. The project that Jeff is referencing, or the portion of the project that Jeff is referencing is our phase two portion of the project that we also have site plan approval on, we also have CD approval on, we also have utility permits. We're well down the road with DOT. Um, the roads are rough graded at this point. The blasting has already occurred. Um, when we went through the initial zoning, this issue was not brought up. Um, and, I, and to my knowledge, everyone was notified and nobody had a concern at that point. Uh, Jeff has reached out to me. Last week he did. We spoke by phone. We spoke by phone again today, and I told him I would meet him on site, and I would see if I could work with him. I can't promise you that I can do anything because Durham has their own agenda. DOT has their own agenda. MI Homes is, you know, I've got, I've got my duty to fulfill. But I did tell him that I would meet him next week and see if we could work out some kind of, some kind of, uh, mutual help that we could that we could assist him with with his road widening that he's got to undertake at some point when he and the monastery school chooses to expand or do whatever they're doing um, as was pointed out it is a small school it is a, dra a gravel path is their driveway that he is referencing it's not like it's a paved collector road or something of that magnitude is a gravel path um, mm -hmm. We're here to we're here to be a good neighbor. At I, the end of the day, that's what I'm that's what I'm offering is to be a good neighbor to the monastery. So. I appreciate that. Let, do I have a question for for the the gentleman who spoke for Mr. Ammons? Uh, Mr. Ammons, if you come to the mic, just that helps the people who are watching from home. Um, I, I, when I went out there and looked, and I looked around, and I looked at their property. Uh, quite frankly, I did not notice this prop situation and I did not anticipate it so uh, you're, you're gonna have to help me picture it um, I don't know what you, how your property is laid out but he characterized your driveway as a gravel road is it possible that the solution may lie on your property could could your driveway be moved to a better place well currently our, our driveway is at like the southernmost end of our property line which is the closest to them so we can't and then and they're just down here so we can't go any further or we're into some of the Dell Webb area so uh, it, um, but, Would it but it did appear they own across from where our driveway is I mean we have a big concrete monument sign we have a soccer field right there um, it is a gravel road we hope to pave it at some point but um, uh, you know and, and I, I appreciate this situation Jeremy's in I'm not trying to throw him under the bus or anything and when the first rezoning came through there was no you know the road layout wasn't exactly on there and typically 
you know, as part of the DOT and getting the roads planned, they, they do an existing map and they show where all the roads are. And if you see the map on there, they show some of that. They just never showed our driveway. And so I, I appreciate all of that. My question is, is it possible to move your driveway on your land to create a greater distance and consequently less likelihood of confusion as your parents come and go and their residents come and go? Um, we could, we have room to, we, we have more, we have more frontage on Andrews Chapel Road, but we do have a soccer field as part of that. So, you know, it would require a lot of internal work through our parking lot and to our school and that, in those items, it's not just a matter of swing it out another way without having to build the road, but we have additional frontage on Andrews Chapel. And so if I may, one more question, Madam Chairman. Yes. Uh, so um, the question is to the folks from my homes. Uh, is this, you mentioned being a good neighbor, are you in a situation where you might be able to look at that and help them move their driveway? Not, not knowing their property and not knowing what would be involved, I cannot make that commitment. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are the other uh, commissioners who would like to speak? Uh, Commissioner Ghosh and Commissioner Whitley. Um, on this driveway uh, situation, I, I have a question for, I think, Mr. Ammons. Uh, my, my question is, you know, when did this become an issue? Because evidently it wasn't previously. Um, NCDOT uh, had some sort of sign off on the site plan and was you know, at that time, they didn't think that this was an issue, so when did it become an issue? Uh, well, I mean, we're not privy to their plans, and so as we saw them developing, and then this most recent rezoning request came in, it showed where the driveway was. And so that's when it first came to my attention that we got this in the mail, and they said, you know, review this document that we have, and I saw the driveways didn't line up. So, you know, I don't think the earlier request had the site plan all laid out and showed exactly where the driveway was. We just knew Hey, they develop behind us, they're developing across the street from us. Uh, I happen to be a civil engineer, traffic guy. They always make you line driveways up. Wherever I go, I line driveways up. Uh, you either need to move it further away or you need to move it closer, you know? Um, and so and this one is just right in the worst spot. I mean, they, their triangle for the, uh, the turn lane in the middle will be stacked right through their intersection turning left into our school uh, in the morning, afternoons, ball games, that kind of stuff. So. It just came up most recently when this request came up. Yeah, I appreciate your evaluation of of the site. I, I mean, at the same time, I appreciate NCDOT's evaluation. I'm having trouble understanding why, um, you well, know, why it occurred this way if it is an unsafe situation generally when driveways well, are not. Well, DOT was surprised by it when we did meet with them, mm -hmm. and they went back to the existing map, and it just wasn't picked up on that map either. So. I mean, it makes no sense. Do you have a driveway permit? Sure, yeah. And so... I don't understand. And, and to me, no matter what, what the case was or why it happened, that doesn't mean we just kicked down the road further a dangerous situation. No, I, I, I appreciate that, but I mean, at the same time, there's, there's a site plan that's been approved. You obviously have a driveway permit. Your site plan, whenever you built the school or whatever, uh, was approved. There's, there's, maybe there's a mistake here. I can't understand. Uh, there's no one from NCDOT here that can answer this question. I don't know if Bill Judge has any insight on this. I'd be uh, open to hearing that. This is a kind of a confusing situation. Yeah, Bill Judge with transportation again. I, I think primarily what happened on all the parties involved, the, the school has an, ex, an existing driveway permit for, mm -hmm. I think it's less than 50 students the existing school mm -hmm. um, the uh, so when the new development and site plan was coming in um, there was an understanding or an expectation there was no no knowledge I guess that the school was looking at an expansion now that water and sewer was was coming in and that was probably the, the amount overlooked with all the development between Del Webb this development has now brought water and sewer to the area the school now has an opportunity to expand to a much larger campus and that wasn't taken into consideration when, when this driveway point was approved, was the potential for the school to want to expand. Okay, that, that makes sense. So is the school looking to expand? Yes. Uh, 
Certainly, yes. I mean, we bought 40 acres a long time ago. We, it sure. was with the foresight of that would be a good area to grow one day. So, and we were limited by the water and the sewer. So certainly now that that's come, our, well, our intentions I mean, are to grow the school, yes. That has come, and it hasn't come at no cost. I mean, developers have extended mm -hmm. the utilities out that way. And I appreciate your concern. However, I mean, I don't see why we would make this developer changed its driveway so that you can expand your school without you having to pay. Whether we expand or not, it. they should be lined up. I mean, I, well, I don't, I don't know if that's true. NCDOT did not come to the same conclusion. We're aware of your driveway and the driveway that was being. DOT claimed they weren't aware of our driveway because of. I just have trouble believing that. It, Madam Chair. What Bill Judge yeah. said was that there wasn't enough capacity at the school for that driveway to be an issue even if they weren't aligned. That's, well, now, if they expand, there could be an issue there. And I appreciate that issue needs to be addressed. The question I'm trying to figure out is who should address it? The, the DOT missed it when they approved theirs because they didn't see, they, they don't have all their driveway permits sitting in where they pull them up. Okay. They go to the existing map that's supplied to them, <clears throat> the, the existing condition map, and it wasn't drawn on there. So in your opinion, it was the developer's fault? I, 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 it should have, I think it should have been included on that map, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, I mean, I think I've got all the answers I need. I, I, I understand the issue, and I'm not disagreeing that it is an issue. I think that the question is really who needs to address this issue. Do I have other commissioners who would like to speak? Yes, Mr. Commissioner Whitley, my apologies. It's getting late. It is, it is getting late. Mr. Mr. Judge. Yeah, you're right. Leave it to DOT to give us a problem. But has it ever been the position of the city of Durham when there's a problem to say, well, it's okay because one party is small and only have 50 children that this big development can come in and do what it has to do and let them worry about it. So, yeah, Bill Judge with Transportation, no, I mean, certainly there was no intention on anybody's part to basically have the developer's responsibility or not pass along to a school or any other property owner, it was just, Simply, the, the facts that were known at the time was that the school was a relatively low volume driveway. I have not spoken directly with NCDOT. That the school met separately with them from, from us, but um, so I can't speak directly as to whether they thought of the school or not. But even had they thought of the school, they would have had to basically make their decision based on it being a driveway for a school of less than 50 students, which is significantly less than what now the school is proposing. Um, additionally, I should point out, the I believe the um, as part of the developer's plans, while they do line up or potentially could line up, I think there's an existing house there that they're at least maintaining for a number of years. So that's part of their phasing, that the existing house would basically have to, have to come down um, in order to line up with the school, which they're not proposing at this point. My thinking is that DOT made a mistake. Am I wrong? I mean, I won't say you're wrong. I would just say that they made a decision based on the information they had at the time, and they made a decision that, um, that has allowed for an offset between the driveways. So would... I'd be wrong to think that um, DOT needs to be part of solving this problem? Well, they certainly will be, and that's, I guess, what I was trying at earlier with my sort of first response is that we have a situation, it's less than desirable, but we'll just have to figure out a way to manage it as the school comes in with the expansion plan, how to, how to best provide for that. So the city that I love. 
will come to the aid of the little guy. Well, the, it, it won't the, be a city effort alone. It'll be a combination of the city, the NCDOT, and the school um, developing a developing a solution. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Whitley. Are there other commissioners who would like to speak? Commissioner Miller and Commissioner Miller. Commissioner Freeman. Madam Chair, if I've, I've already spoken. Please let Deidreana go first, and then I'll close with my brief remark. Thank you. Commissioner Freeman. Thank you. I, I just want to... Um, Sitting here, I just can't help but want to apologize to the school on behalf of all the bureaucrats in, in deciding, making these decisions for you, and then questioning you about uh, the way things have gone. Uh, I just want to make sure that I say that up front. It doesn't feel right for the questions to be directed to the school that's been sitting there for 40 years. And then second of all, I just want to make sure that I say, Understanding that the site plans have been set forward and you, being a good neighbor as MI is trying to be, I don't think it's, I don't think it would be um, good for us as a, a body of folks around the, the on the planning commission to move forward with this without at least giving um, MI a chance to revisit it. And as, as, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. As the gentleman mentioned, he doesn't know the layout of their property, so to at least investigate what's possible or what's not possible before we move forward. I would like to request a, a 30 day at least um, review. Because I just, I, it just doesn't sit well with me that we're in inconveniencing a school for a site plan oversight or oversight of whatever, whomever is at fault we should at least be able to, to take some time and slow this, this train down regardless. Okay, well, staff comment first. Yes, Jamie Sonyak, Planning Department. Uh, was just conferring with my colleagues and it's our opinion that 30 days isn't gonna be enough to review this and come back with a solution that makes sense for all the parties. Um, Would it's 60 our, days be good? Six, 60 days would be favorable. 60 days, adjusting the 60. 60 days work. Thank you. Except a motion uh, by Commissioner uh, Freeman for a 60-day continuance and a second by Commissioner uh, Whitley. Um, all in favor of this motion, let it be known by. I did, oh, were there questions? Okay, can I ask a question? Uh, before we vote on that, I would like to know what the applicant think about a continuance. You don't care about the driveway. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, <laughs> I would. I would not like a continuance. I would like to go ahead and have a vote. And uh, I'm saying this out of respect, but I would also like to. To to establish this that I don't know what the school's end game is what their growth what their growth patterns are going to be for five years 10 years 15 years I really don't have any idea um, I can't tell you whether their uh, the alignment of Andrews Chapel Road is going to dictate a right in a right out a left over a full movement uh, there's just too many variables there's just too many variables um, at this time, we do have approval. We do have, we do have um, our zoning in place and our site plan in place. We're not proposing to change any of those details. Uh, I, I have made a commitment to work with the school and try to reach some kind of um, uh, neighborly cooperation. But at this point, I can't, I can't commit to you any more than that because there's just too many variables. Uh, Commissioner Miller, I'll recognize, has another question. Again, a question for the developer. Is it my understanding that the site plan that you currently have approved is for the existing zoning, not for the, uh, 
this zoning uh, that you are asking for tonight? Yes, sir. We, we do have an existing zoning that was approved about. Well, I know you have an existing zoning. I'm asking is your site plan refer to the, your existing zoning or is it based I, upon I'm, the zoning as, as, as you're asking for us to change it? I, I'm referring to the existing zoning that not the one that I'm asking for this evening. So here's my question to you then. If for some reason the zoning that change that you're asking for tonight was turned down, would you just go ahead and develop the project the way you currently have it approved? More than likely, sir. Okay, thank you. I have a motion on the table, and I do have a second that we offer a 60-day continuance. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by raising your right hand. This is for the continuance. Yes. Yes. Mr. Busby? No. Ms. Freeman? Yes. Mr. Goats? No. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. No. Yes. 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 He does. Let's move to the next item. Uh, public hearing text amendment um, to the Unified Development Ordinance mass grading buffers. Oh, good evening, good night. I don't know, maybe good morning. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Um, <laughs> TC 16-00006 uh, um, is a uh, technical text amendment, uh, technical changes text amendment uh, to modify the uh, standard, some of the standards to the mass grading uh, buffers within, um, um, within section 9.5.1 or section 9.5 mass grading buffers and revegetation. Um, on November 2nd, 2016, the Joint City County Planning Commission or JCCPC received an informational item regarding mass grading. The discussion at that meeting resulted in two requests from the JCCPC. The first request uh, was to initiate a text amendment that revised mass grading buffers to match those allowed by state statute, and that statute is in your, attach in your agenda packet as a attachment B. And the second request was to provide a report at a later date regarding costs and benefits of mass grading, and that's still uh, in progress and for future discussions at JCCPC. Um, and in order for them to provide policy direction to staff. Uh, this text amendment uh, obviously uh, addresses the first request. Um, the text amendment basically does three things. It, it increases the buffer widths along right-of-way and developed and uh, undeveloped property uh, for mass grading buffers uh, to those allowed by state statute. Um, through the review of the state statute, we came upon some issues, uh, well, at least uh, I came upon some issues that I ran by the city attorney's office, um, questioning whether the current, stat current rules in the UDO were exceeding the authority of the statute, and the, the opinion of the city attorney's office was that it was. So there are additional modifications found in your uh, draft ordinance that does the following. It, it specifies uh, that the mass grading buffers um, per the state statute only applied within the city jurisdiction, um, and that it also focuses on just protecting existing vegetation. So any, uh, any, request, any requirements to, uh, further, to add further vegetation or increase opacity uh, is beyond the statute. Uh, mass grading buffers are temporary buffers around the, the site prep 
around the preparation of a site for future development. So the statute is pretty clear for protecting existing vegetation for future buffers, future project boundary buffers, which um, you see a lot of times in your development plans, at least indicated in your development plans. So the additional vegetation would be provided at that time for your future project boundary buffers that are more permanent buffers. Um, that's the extent of the changes. I'll be happy to answer any questions. That's correct. Yeah, it, it's, it's increased to, to match the extent allowed by state statute. So all the numbers are at the maximum allowed. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yes. Got to have a public um, there, I have no one who has signed up to speak. Are you here to speak? I don't have any. Are there commissioners who would like to speak to this issue? Commissioner Busby. Thank Commissioner you, Madam Chair. Miller. Okay. Well, and I appreciate the staff's work on this. The, the only thing I would, I would note is that while, uh, and I, this is the intent of the Joint City-County Planning Committee, was to say let's, let's go and use what we have under authorizing legislation, which the, the intent, I was at the meeting, was to strengthen the mass grading buffer provisions. And the good news is, to some degree, that's true in other cases we have the unintended consequences of actually taking some steps backwards on our mass grading buffers because we were out of conformity with our enabling legislation. So I just want to point that out that uh, while this is an appropriate approach, it is unfortunate that it's not as strong as what the, the Joint City County Planning Committee had initially hoped with their aspirational recommendations. Mm -hmm. And so just want to make that point because the second bite of the apple is obviously then very important, which is what are some of the, the longer term opportunities to actually review mass grading buffer provisions moving forward. So there, there are no changes I'm going to recommend here. Uh, it is just one of those be careful what you wish for moments because we all wanted to see these provisions get uniformly stronger and we got a little stronger and we got a little weaker in my opinion. And, and, and to, to add on to what Commissioner Bosnia has said, it is the intent for JCCPC to take a, hard, take a, a harder look at mass grading in general and see what are the opportunities to, yeah, what can they do, what are other, other ways to do site preparation for development that aren't necessarily mass grading. Um, they're not anywhere close to giving policy direction yet. They're going to be getting information in, at future meetings and then staff will get some direction at that point. Um, and we've, we've just been collecting information at this time. So there's no timeline at this point. Are there other commissioners who would like to speak? If not, can I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move that the Commission move the TC160006 mass grading buffers forward uh, to Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Uh, motion to approve item TC160006 uh, forward to the City Council with the favorable recommendation, second by Commissioner um, Harris. All in favor of this motion, raise your right hand. Motion carries 13-0. Thank you. Thank you. We have new business. Well, you still have old business. You still have old business. There's a second item under old business.
Yes. The unfinished business? Okay, yes, there it is. Thank you. Ready? Yes. All right, so you previously, back in November and December, had some opportunity for discussion and input on the work program and the item was continued. And so I am here and all ears I have some comments. Good. Commissioner Harris. With reference to your open space. Huh? Oh, we are where? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have anything. Yeah. All right. I take it you guys are ready for us to do more work next year, right? Thank you. So. Was that the whole work plan, or was it a budget thing? Um, my notes indicated it was a work program. Never mind. It's late. I Commissioner Miller commented extensively on it, and he has uh, apparently. So we're ready to move on to the next item. New business. My problem is, is I didn't look at the next page. I thought we were done. I did too. <laughs> I did say midnight. I'm glad to be wrong. Just this one. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Scott Whiteman from the Planning Department. Um, here tonight to present and for your review and hopeful recommendation of the urban open space plan. Uh, this is a project that's been under development since 2010. Uh, it was recommended as one of the uh, projects that should be put in our work program in the comprehensive plan when it was adopted in 2005. Uh, this would uh, join four other adopted open space plans, which include uh, the downtown open space plan from 2012, as well as the uh, New Hope Corridor, the Little River open space plan, and the Eastern Durham open space plan. Um, when the planning began for this, it was done being done in conjunction with the downtown open space plan, and then the, the two were divided into two separate projects. Uh, this plan would cover the entirety of the urban tier plus the three compact neighborhood tiers that are encompassed within the urban tier. It does exclude this, the far southeastern portion of the urban tier, which was already included in the, the Eastern Durham Open Space Plan. So there are uh, three key components of the urban open space plan, an inventory, an analysis, and uh, recommendations. The inventory in includes uh, an inventory of um, some already existing plans, some adopted, and some just prepared. These includes the Parks and Recreation Master Plan, the Durham Trails and Greenways Plan, and uh, the Watershed Management Plans. Uh, this map here is included in your document, and uh, it shows the properties that were shown in the Ellerby Creek and Third Fork Creek Master Plans as high value properties that should be uh, considered for acquisition which this would be adopted as part of this plan. Uh, neither of the watershed master plans were actually adopted by council. We also included an environmental inventory, which included uh, things like biodiversity, tree canopy, temperature change. Um, this map here is showing uh, some of the biodiversity and wildlife assessment of lands within the urban tier. As you might imagine, the only areas that have any uh, real value are in the, the stream buffers and they're actually quite challenged as, since this is a heavily urbanized area. We also prepared inventory of parks and other open spaces including open, informal open spaces such as uh, cemeteries and historic sites. So moving on to the analysis, uh, we prepared an open space suitability map 
in conjunction with the, the Open Space Committee of the Durham Open Space and Trails Commission. Uh, this took a bunch of, uh, some key factors into what makes uh, a piece of land a high priority for preservation or acquisition. These included um, things like riparian buffers, tree cover, and proximity to planned and existing parks and trails. Uh, ran a model and ranked all the, the properties within the urban tier based on the number of criteria they met. Um, so the, the ones shown in this map in blue are of the ones of, of high suitability. Uh, one important thing that's a recommendation of this plan is that this not be a, uh, a static but a dynamic model and so we'll staff and uh, DOS will continue to work on uh, refining the criteria and updating it since certain things will will change over time. We also prepared an analysis of access to parks uh, using the city's uh, benchmark of uh, every citizen being within a half mile uh, distance of a public park. Um, the analysis was actually used using existing pedestrian street networks, not uh, as the crow flies. Uh, distance. Generally it shows that the coverage is pretty good in the, the urban tier. Um, there are some gaps, you'll say like in uh, West Durham near Duke University, kind of northwest part of the urban tier, although a lot of those are filled with kind of informal open spaces like uh, Duke's East Campus, um, Duke Homestead, that sort of thing. Um, there are also some areas which are not really residential and don't necessarily need to have the same level of service for for park access that residential areas do. Uh, two notable exceptions for the access to parks are the, uh, the Colonial Village area in the northeast part of this, of the urban tier and the Tuscaloosa Lakewood neighborhood in the southwest portion. We also performed an environmental justice analysis. Um, the definition for environmental justice was borrowed from what is our transportation planning uh, definition for for uh, what we called a community of concern. These were areas where populations with uh, concentrations of minorities, Latinos, elderly persons, low income persons, and uh, people with limited English proficiency. Any census block group with four of those five was considered a community of concern. The good news is, as like with the rest of the urban tier, these, most of these areas have, uh, there, there were seven, most of them have pretty good access to public park land. Uh, you see on the, the, the top two on, the, on this slide are uh, kind of the, the far eastern portion of northeast central Durham near Wellens Village. Um, the area that's not covered is mostly commercial. The other one is uh, the area along ID5 kind of between Walltown and uh, Brogdon Middle School. Uh, I'll note that with the development of the West Ellerby Creek Greenway, this area will have better access to open space in the near future. Um, some areas that aren't as well served, like I mentioned before, on, on the bottom shows the area near Colonial Village uh, in the northeast part of this area. Also, the, uh, the areas north of Duke's campus, which is now in the Irwin Road compact neighborhood. So there uh, were a series of objectives and recommendations that would apply generally to all areas within the, the planning area. Uh, to generalize a bit, they are a, I mean, a well-maintained and integrated open space system, increase recreation in open space, improve access to open space, protect and improve environmental quality, engage communities in stewardship of open spaces, and increase, uh, increase tree canopy. Uh, they were also the, the study area was also divided into districts to make it uh, just solely for a more manageable geography for, for graphical purposes. And there were specific uh, recommendations and suggestions for each of those five areas, which uh, I do have on here, but I won't go into deta detail just, uh, at this point since it's 1015. But I'd be happy to, to address any of those if uh, any of the commissioners have any questions. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions and we would uh, request that the commission recommend approval of the urban open space plan. Thanks. Commissioner Harris. 
Uh, first of all, I found this to be very confusing because when I look at this, I'm looking for open space and it's urban. And so it don't go any further north than 075 east of Roxborough Road and Carver Street west of Roxborough Road. And by the same token, it, on the east side, it doesn't go any further than uh, Dubois Drive and 70, which as I look at it, I have to mind my, make it mindful of myself, you know, that it is just the open area and not the suburban area. That's right, yeah. It's the just the urban tier is adopted in a comprehensive plan. The second thing, and more important, is you have District 1 through 5. It, it would be great if you call it another nomenclature, uh, Area 1 through 5 or you know, zone one through five, because if I think of district two, I'm thinking northern Durham, but district one, east Durham, but your district doesn't line up that way. Yeah, I don't think, we hadn't considered that people might confuse those with the, the PACs. It, yeah, it does, because most other districts, you know, it's associated with police districts. And when I look at your district one, which is, uh, which would be normally district two, and your district five, which would normally be downtown, you got South Durham here, so. If you could just change that yeah, we, nomenclature. Yeah, Commissioner Harris will uh, try to consider a, a better term for those. Commissioner Bry. I want to thank you for bringing the plan forward. Uh, all I want to do is call your attention to what I think are some very minor corrections. Uh, page four. Uh, under the Unified Development Ordinance, uh, the first sentence starts out, all developments must comply standards. I think you need to have the word with between complying standards. I wholeheartedly agree with your edit, Mr. Commissioner Bryan. Uh, Moving quickly along to page 38, your community of concern number three, uh, into the second sentence, the representation of four environmental justice committees of concern. Uh, this is the only one where you have not identified who those committees of concern were. All the others you identify who the committees of concern are. So I think you just need to be consistent. Let the record reflect on out of my head. Yeah. And uh, finally, on page 58, uh, under objective one, items number seven and number eight for responsibility uh, shouldn't historic preservation be included in that? Yeah, that's, I think that's a reasonable request. Yeah. That's all I had, thank you. Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Freeman. Oh. Thank you. I. I just wanted to thank you for uh, put, pushing this forward as well and including an environmental justice population. But I want to make sure that we don't um, confuse uh, or muddy the water and saying like the minority race population. I, I just feel like this, this needs to be narrowed down some. The, there's a difference between the cross section of race and low income than there is of just race. And the same thing for ethnicity. There's a difference in ethnicity, and I know what you're, where you're going with the area of concern, but it's not quite clear or there yet. And I'm not sure what to. Yeah, and to me, it's it's uh, it would have to be at least four of those five things. It would not just be a, a block group that has a, a popula high population of minorities. It would be one that has. Um, low English proficiency or low income and maybe I'm missing something because I didn't see that 
that noted that there was that it had to be four. Yeah, it's. Sorry. I may not be able to find it uh, on the spot right now, but I assure you that the, that that explanation is in there. Commissioner Gibbs. Oh. However, recent state legislature, I'm sorry. Sarah Young with the Planning Department. I'm sorry, page 32. Hard to see, a little light past 10 o'clock at night. Um, it says, for the next phase of the analysis, block groups with an occurrence of four or five communities of concern are analyzed further. So that's where it stipulates that that's the threshold. Well, rather than saying just communities of concern, like specifically like the environmental justice populations, four or five of the specific environmental justice populations being caused for concern. So. Okay. <clears throat> Commissioner Gibbs, did you also have a question? Uh, I don't know how uh, descriptive these things are uh, about the physical access. Uh, I've heard you mention access, and that that brings to mind, does this record anything about the accessibility, the handicapped accessibility, or would we find that somewhere else, or could it be included? This just not, as a general term, if if not a detailed thing. This does not include that. It's kind of more general than that. We're, we're looking more at just access from, say, at someone's residence to a, a public park. Uh, I believe the, the Parks and Recreation Master Plan is much more detailed about what improvements yeah. each park needs, and I think that's probably the most appropriate place to, to deal with, yeah, with accessibility. I'd, okay, yeah. I'd, right. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner. One Harris. additional comment to the staff. I did not get an approval sheet for the uh, open space, urban open, so I wrote it on the back of my last page, so you know. It's on the back of the last page. Right over on the front I did. of the page. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Whitley. Um, thank you for giving your report. Can you tell me? Um, how this open space is going to benefit Eastern. Well, one of the things, it's to provide general priorities about uh, how to increase open space in the, the urban part of Durham. Um, and then one thing in particular, we don't get into a whole lot of detail on this because there's already been a lot of uh, analysis from other groups about um, the shortage of trees in East Durham. Um, but one of, one of the records, trees. the tree canopy, um, how East Durham, the tree canopy in East Durham is much lower than it is in most of the other parts of urban Durham. The, the tree canopy in East Durham is significantly less than it is in uh, most of the other parts of urban Durham. Hmm. And that uh, when we prioritize funding for tree planting programs, we should uh, prioritize the, the East Durham, since that's lagging behind the other parts of the city. So we need more trees, and what else? So in general, uh, for like for example, when we're when uh, surplus properties are from the city or county arise, we can use the, the suitability analysis to determine whether it's something that needs to be, should be saved for uh, open space purposes, or if it's something, for example, if it's in the middle of a neighborhood, maybe it's more appropriate to be used for uh, development of affordable housing or something like that. Um, we have plenty of housing. What we don't have is banks. We don't have parks that um, are well kept like other parks. Um, we don't have the recreation that our children need. Um, 
and we have plenty of open space since there's very little development. Thank you. Can I get a... Uh, just, Commissioner just, Miller would like to make some comments. Very quickly. Um, so th this document contemplates a comprehensive plan, but I did not see, and so and I have a question. The comprehensive plan, the future land use map, has um, large areas of land that are designated recreation and open space. Do those designations in the future land use map very closely correspond with the properties identified in the inventory in this document? Or is there a disconnect? It probably is a little bit of disconnect. There is with all the all the open space plans, which I think is something that really needs to be addressed in a, a new it, comprehensive plan. It worries me because we, you know, the first word of comprehensive plan is comprehensive. The um, and so that worries me. This document contemplates a comprehensive plan, but it doesn't include, or at least I I don't interpret it to include in the implementation measures. Uh, any suggestions that we change the comprehensive plan to more specifically inc include the recommendations here? In other words, when when we're asked to rezone property or to evaluate development projects, how will I use this document to that make that evaluation? Do you intend for us to use this document for that evaluation? And what is the policy and regulatory path from this document back through the comprehensive plan that would allow me to do that. So as I know it sounds like a bit of a circular reference, we have plans that were adopted prior to the comprehensive plan that are adopted as reference in the comprehensive plan, and then we have other adopted plans that come afterwards, after the comprehensive plan, which when we say it's a uh, zoning case is uh, consistent with applicable plans and policies, it's not just a comprehensive plan, it's all adopted plans. I, I realize that, but it okay. seems to me that uh, I mean, the state statute talks about the comprehensive plan. Uh, and so one of the things that I would like to do is when we create a document like this that is so related to land, I would like to have the, uh, an implementation measure here is to go back and make the comprehensive plan contemplate this document by sp with specific policies saying, you know, when we talk about a, 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 that, you know, uh, a, a, a residential uh, design in the urban tier is supposed to work with natural features and what have you. It would be nice if it if it gave me permission to cite this and say, and well, this development plan doesn't recognize the the reservation of open space in the inventory or or some other policy. I just want I'm looking for a policy path to connect this document to the work that we do here every month. And. Well, it, we do do that with the, um, so as uh, a representative of, of DOST, uh, we review all zoning cases that come in against existing open space plans. Um, we don't actually have a whole lot of rezonings in the areas that are affected by the current open space plans. We probably have a lot more in the urban tier, but we do flag any recommendations uh, from any of the open space plans that would be affected by a zoning change. Yeah, um, but DOST does that, but... We're the ones that, that are charged yeah, we, with it. We would, we would provide through the case planner those comments to you. That's, for example, like in the Eastern Derm Open Space Plan, there's uh, wider stream buffers require, uh, recommended in certain areas. Mm -hmm. So if there's a zoning case that would be affected by that, we would say uh, in order to comply with the Eastern Derm <coughs> Open Space Plan, you would need to provide an X uh, width buffer. I guess what I'm saying is, is what I really want before I can vote to say that this is a good document is a clear policy path that connects this to the comprehensive plan. If uh, City Council and the Board of Commissioners adopt this, it will be an adopted plan, just like the comprehensive plan, which would be... Uh, but it's not the, but the comprehensive plan loses its comprehensive quality when, when there are other plans that it doesn't contemplate. Well, that's fair, but we, it kind of puts us in a tough spot where we can't adopt any like the Ninth Street plan or anything like that, we couldn't adopt subsequent plans without amending the entire comprehensive plan. Uh, Commissioner Whitley. Yeah, I do have I do have something I would like for you to consider. 
um, open space um, development um, around our creeks. Um, we have taken advantage of it on Taylor Street, uh, um, um, where the elementary school is, but there are other opportunities along those creeks that we could we could really um, be more creative than than we have, and there are lots of places where we could we could um, East Durham could benefit from it, um, and I I just <coughs> wanted to throw it out so you would have something. Okay, I agree with that, and I think this does address that. Uh, uh, and we pr have preserving land near streams pretty well. Commissioner Freeman. Thank you. Um, just tagging along on that comment that Reverend Whitley just mentioned, it's very important to also acknowledge the economic, I'm sorry, the environmental justice issue that can arise in building in floodplains, especially that elementary school you just mentioned because they have sewage coming into the building. But um, I wanted to also ask, I know you know you mentioned that this was going back to DOS. What's the diversity look like on DOS? And do people look like me on DOS? Because I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the makeup. And uh, I'm happy to answer that question as the Planning Commission's represent, representative to the to DOS, to the Durham Open Space and Trails Commission. Uh, it's a combination of city and county appointees. <laughs> and so I don't have the exact numbers. I know that it's fair to say that like most committees that diversity is really important and is something we're continuing to strive towards. Uh, we do have a mix of representatives from, from the city and from the county, um, di different backgrounds, different parts of the city, different ages. Um, so it's, it's a fairly representative body. Uh, I, I also did wanna say thank you to Scott in particular as the staff person for DOST uh, Scott stepped into that role. This worked its way through multiple committees at DOST, and so is really, we spent a lot of time on this, uh, trying to get this right, and so I know the input that all of you have offered tonight is very helpful to make this as strong as possible. Uh, I would urge this body to move this forward and, and recommend that we, we move this along. Uh, this, in my opinion, is, is a long overdue piece of the puzzle that DOST has said we want to make sure we have an urban open space plan. Um, Commissioner Miller, I hear your point. I would love to, over time, make sure that we, we do have a comprehensive plan. Um, I, but in, in that absence, I want to make sure we still have an urban open space plan that puts forward what we'd like to see, and it gives us some tools to help make decisions as we move forward on proposals. So. Uh, at the appropriate time, I'll be ready to, to make a motion, but I know you, you so may I just have additional comments. So I want to make sure comments. that with any of these motions that there is an inclusion around um, conditions for this community of concern to be spelled out and then also making sure that there's a cross-section because I'm recognizing that the areas, I'm, I'm assuming you're saying across the ABCD areas five, not in the single area of environmental justice, five. And what I'm afraid of is that exactly what you're saying will happen and that folks will think we have something in place to address the issue and actually not address the issue, specifically because you're spelling it out but you're not saying it. And so you're not saying specifically that black and brown people are disproportionately at risk in this community, in this urban area of not having access to the urban open space. And if it was spelled out specifically like that, it'd be different. But if it's not, I feel a little antsy about saying we have a tool or anything to move forward with. So just make sure. Madam Chair. Rich, I got a question for you. Uh, let me recognize Commissioner Busby and Commissioner Whitley. And did you finish your, okay, your comments? Thank you. Well, and thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, what I was gonna say, I'm, I'm ready and willing to make a motion, but actually I, I may want to have you make a motion to make sure that we adequately capture your, your point. And, and I'll be ready to second that motion. Would you, or uh, Commissioner Freeman, if you could uh, 
after the meeting and either your comments or through an email, just specifically tell me where your concerns are. I, I feel confident we can address them. You, my question, my question is, um, you're asking us to approve this without, um, we have creased the run through all our, our of Eastern um, that needs dredging and needs cleaning, um, environmental justice. Um, and creating open space that our kids can um, do science projects and we have elementary schools that are close to those, these creeks. We have residential homes that are close to, we even have parks that these creeks run through. Um, where they underutilized because we haven't did we haven't we haven't developed open space for them. So you want us to approve this without um, that being brought forward, or is there a way to? to get commitment to have this done, that you will look seriously about if, and, uh, and ask for our approval. I would defer to Scott as well to add any additional points. I know the, the goal here is to make sure we have a good, strong plan in place that everyone feels comfortable with and, and does make sure we're adequately I, addressing the issues. I don't, I don't know if anything yeah, you'd want to add anything, Scott. Commissioner Whitley, I, c I can't say that it addresses all your concerns. Uh, I think this is the, the first step in trying to preserve open space and uh, uh, establishing priorities, but uh, there's always work to come, fighting for funding, those sorts of things. Um, you know. I, I think Malcolm said it um, when everybody has some on their plate, and there's nothing in mind that does make me a diner. Um, and I guess what they're suggesting is that, like all other plans that the city has, um, we have to wait. I'll go ahead and make that motion that we approve this um, open, I'm sorry, urban open space plan with a condition to make sure that we address the inadequately address the, or adequately address the disparity in low income communities of color in the environmental justice section. Does that help Scott? I'm just trying it to. It does. Sure. Okay. Okay, um, motion by Commissioner Freeman that we approve the urban open space plan with stated adjustments. Second by Commissioner Whitley. Um, all in favor of this motion, let it be known by raising your right hand. All opposed? Thank you. Stated adjustments. Yes. I'm sorry, what was that? He voted against. Oh, you voted? voted. Who voted against? Did he? Who voted against? Wait, let hell then. Good for him. I almost. Moved. <laughs>